Hello and welcome to another magnificent afternoon here on a hot winter's day live from the African bush and on this very special Women's Day here in South Africa we celebrate by starting off our show with one of the most famous huntresses in all the kingdom and in fact some of my favorite now I'm speaking softly because they also happen to be very protective mothers aren't we lucky this is just the best and this is Safari Live. As I said, an absolutely wonderful afternoon here with our lionesses lying up in the shade because it is a particularly hot afternoon. Now, why was I keeping my voice down? Why am I keeping my voice down? Well, it's not just our lovely lionesses lying up in the shade. If you look really closely, okay, even if you look really closely, you might not be able to see them. They're playing hard to get this afternoon, but our lovely Nkuhuma pride has their five cubs with them here there and everywhere actually I say five I've only seen three I did hear a report that James had five this morning it seems as though there's only three of them and for now our hungry and Kahumas after their failed buffalo hunt of yesterday evening that I heard a great deal about from the rest of our Safari Live crew who were fortunate enough to witness them trying to hunt a buffalo not more than about 500 meters away from our camp. How absolutely incredible is that? A special way to start off one's evening. Now my name is Jamie and I have Zander on camera with me. Hayden of course is out once again with Viam and we are bringing you a live safari from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And as I said, today is Women's Day and I can't think of a more appropriate way to start off our Women's Day here in South Africa. Well, not start off because, you know, it's the middle of our afternoon, but for a lot of our audience, start starting off a new day. But to start off with the five, well, three Nkuhuma lionesses, five out of three is not bad, and they're young cubs, who of course are the incredibly powerful female hunters. Now, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask on our lionesses or anything further, or any comments that you'd like to make, please do so on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And our canny lionesses have chosen an interesting spot to go and have their afternoon siesta. There's trees and bushes and all kinds of things that makes getting a very good view of them relatively tricky. Of course, they don't pick their position with us in mind. They just flop down wherever is comfortable in the shade. And a lovely message from Thomas. Thank you very much, Thomas. Saying happy birthday to myself and to, of course, our female strong final control room where they do all of our directing, producing, and all other manner of very intrinsic roles that they play in our Safari Live team. And Thomas would also like to wish the lionesses a happy Woman's Day. Amber Eyes, happy Woman's Day. And of course, it's not just our lovely lionesses that are wonderful and most famous female characters of the African bush. Let us head over to another one that is equally, if not more so famous, but in this case has spots. And it's not Hayden. Well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's beautiful safari sunset drive here on Juma. My name's Hayden and we are back on our wonderful Queen of Juma, Karula the Leopard. And we just came down here to have a little look to see where she was. So if you've just joined us, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, obviously for our always, our regular um, die-hard safari, saf safarians, if I can say that properly, welcome aboard again. So great to have you with us this afternoon. And we've been 
I've only been back for about two or three days and it's been a real treat because I've been, it's been leopardastic for me. Uh, I didn't think I was going to get to see Karula in such a short time, but of course uh, you just can't plan these things. Karula uh, made a kill about 36 hours ago. She, I don't think we can see it from here, but we will when we pull back. But you might get a little bit, of, there's a big branch right in the way, but just through there, there's a bit of a kill still hang, or a carcass hanging up, I should say. She hoisted that up there yesterday afternoon. So the day before we came down and uh, the news was that she'd killed this impala and then she went off to get her cubs. And then the cubs came through, we came down, we found her lying in the drainage line with her cubs uh, and feeding on this impala that she'd killed, which was absolutely brilliant to watch as well. And we came back and forth during the day. Uh, they fed on that for as long as they needed. And then there was really great behavior watching her uh, not hauling it up a tree, but uh, putting leaves over it, covering it with dirt, and trying to hide the scent for a bit in this drainage line. Very clever behavior that we watched, so she could leave it down here for her youngsters to eat uh, until it got a little bit lighter as well, because uh, it was quite a big impala. And then after they'd consumed a fair amount of it, we watched her haul it up the tree yesterday, and then the cubs also had a little training day. We went to leopard school with uh, Karula and her cubs yesterday as both of them ascended one after the other and fed on that carcass up the tree. Then we left her at the appropriate time and gave her uh, some respect and uh, peace and then came back this morning and sure, lo and behold, there was a hyena uh, asleep on the bank just over to the right of where she is now. And Karula was up the tree. So many of you may have seen this on this morning's drive, but I just wanted to update you and bring you up to speed on the back story behind what's happened over the last 36 hours. And after that, uh, we were sitting here, and we thought she was going to stay up there for some time, and then she stood up, and I thought, she's looking like she wanted to descend, uh, but the hyena came down and sat right under the tree, hoping to get a, a small piece of whatever was hanging up there. And then the hyena, as it walked back up into this little bank, it had a bit of a limp on its right hind foot. And it was, it was definitely favoring that foot, and uh, it laid back down up there. Karula stood back up again and came down the tree. I've never seen this before, and we asked a few other people here this morning, people that have been here 15, 20 years. And she came down the tree, the hyena laid there, just looked over his shoulder like this, or her shoulder. Karula came down, no hissing, no snarling, and just laid down about 5 to 10 metres away, 20 to 30 feet. It was absolutely incredible. And there was no interaction between them other than keeping an eye on each other. So now Karula's gone down into a really cool spot down there in the, in the drainage line or that dry creek bed there. And the hyena's nowhere to be found, but I assure you the hyena will be holed up in the cool somewhere as well. Uh, ready to seize any opportunity. But I'm not sure about this hyena. This hyena seems to have a very bad limp. And who knows what the behavior was. But I talked to James about it as well, and he said he has seen it before. Uh, but it was very interesting just to see the... Normally, she'd come down the, the tree and snarl and carry on uh, towards the hyena. The hyena would normally run towards her. She'd either go back up the tree or run off. But um, they just tolerated each other and stayed in the same space and went to sleep which was rather incredible. Now the cubs, I'm sure you all want to know where the cubs are. The cubs are directly behind us. They're in a very inaccessible spot for us to get to, which is great, great for them. Um, and whilst you're looking at them, I'm just looking at Karula becoming very alert for some reason. Let's just swing back around here, Vim. Let's just swing back around here. She just suddenly sat up and pricked her ears up. She's looking up right now to see what is left of her efforts yesterday or the day before. No. We do have a few zebra uh, just up above her, about probably five meters above her on a little plateau area there. But she just sat up very alert and she had that look and now she's relaxed a little bit again. I was just about to say, let's leave her be, because she was asleep, and the cubs are asleep as well, right over the other side, but they're in uh, very safe distance from her. 
the cubs are seven months now, as I've mentioned before, and many of you know that, so they're quite alert. But she's just sat up, and she is taking a little bit of notice of something going on down there. We might just sit with her for a What we might do, folks, is just stay with Karula because she has woken up and has become very alert. So we're just going to cross back over to Jamie because how wonderful is that? Jamie Patterson, what is she like? Amazing. She's got line in the first 10 minutes. Okay, let's cross over and see what she's up to. We do indeed have our lines and my sincerest apologies to those of you who are now very confused about the day that it is. It is not in fact my birthday, nor is it the ladies in final control, or indeed the Nkuhuma birthdays, as far as I know. I'm sorry, Thomas, you sent through a lovely message to say Happy Women's Day, and I mangled that spectacularly. Sometimes one's brain go, go, does this, and one's mouth does something else, and you end up with a combination of happy... I don't know where the birthday came from. It's not anybody's birth... Well, it's not anybody's birthday in the Safari Life crew, as far as I know. But it is most, <laughs> most definitely not my birthday. So my apologies. It is Women's Day, which is a public holiday in South Africa, which is to celebrate the protest of all women during the year of 1956, which of course was a very dark period in South Africa's history. And they were marching to the Houses of Parliament in order to protest the, impl the implication of what were to be some incredibly stringent past laws based upon people's race. Of course, a very, very, very dark time in our period. It's now a day that's basically dedicated to celebrating women, to celebrate equality, and so on and so forth. It's not my birthday at all. Now, bear with me for one second. I just want to jump onto the Game Drive channel. Afternoon stations, I'm not sure if you copied me. I've got the Mafazi and Gala and Mabimpans here on Gallagher Shortcut, just to the south of the Miska. And I know that Hayden is with that Ingwe on Elephant Skull. Ah, uh, negative. It's actually very difficult to get in here. It's just south of that Miska. You'd see me from the road. But it is difficult. Visuals 5-5 five, five when you're in, but it's difficult to get in. Sorry, everybody. Just chatting on the game drive comms uh, as to let everybody know that we have the lines here once again. And also to make sure that they don't come bumbling into us. We want to keep the impact that we have on the cubs down to an absolute minimum. And there are cubs here, I promise. We did see them when we first arrived. They have now gone f fast asleep in the shade, directly hidden behind all of the fallen trees and grasses. And Kuma's looking terribly comfortable on this winter's afternoon. Lovely warm day here in the African bush. I was going to tell you what day it was, but I can't remember. I f oh, it's Tuesday. On this Tuesday afternoon. I mean, looking at them, when Amber Eyes got up and moved into a better patch of shade, and I will say that these lionesses are hungry. I'm sure this has been commenting, commented on before, but I, of course, have not been on drive for a little while. So I haven't seen them for a while, but they are looking empty-bellied and like they could use a snack. Now, Herbert and I, when we were out on bushwalk yesterday morning, we found a place where they had killed something, but it was... he Herbert thinks it was an impala, but shared between five lionesses and at least five cubs, if not three extra cubs, because, of course, the youngest Nkuhuma cubs set is going to be old enough soon to start coming to the kills. But that uh, an impala meal doesn't go very far if it's divided between so many mouths to feed, and that, I think, might be why they are so hungry-looking. Sorry, everybody, just um, hold on one second. Just Mike is trying to get hold of me. Go ahead, Mike. Good afternoon, Mike. Yes, you are welcome to. As I said, it's quite hard to get in here, but you're welcome to come and join us. I 
while we're sitting here, listening to the sounds of the bush and watching our lions sleep away, Zander said he could see an elephant. Zander, can you still see an elephant? Because I can hear the elephants. I can't see them. Okay, so they're quite far away still. Uh, awesome, thank you. So Zander's pointing out from his slightly elevated position. can see the movement of the elephants feeding off the vegetation. Now if they do happen to come in this direction, that of course changes the way that our afternoon is going to go. However, what I am going to make sure is make sure of is that we are here this afternoon as it starts to get dark and it starts to get a little bit cooler. Because I am certain that these lions are going to be on the hunt. And James Dugan, absolutely the flies are harsh. Now that we've had a little bit more in the way of water, and the temperatures are starting to heat up. He is twitching away, trying to get rid of them. They are harsh today. And I know because just before we started our sunset safari, there was one that was thoroughly determined to go up my nose. I really don't know how these lions don't drive themselves crazy trying to flick those flies away. Certainly not something that I find it easy to tolerate, but they seem to be relatively used to it. Well, since our lions are well and truly and thoroughly asleep for now, and that's always with the case of a live safari, the for now part is very, very important, let's jump onto the back of Wendy and see what Karula and her amazing little cubs are up to. Well, isn't that fantastic, uh, Jamie, with those lines? It's brilliant to see. We've got two beautiful cats, uh, females with their cubs at the moment. We are still with Karula. She laid her head down. Uh, she was interested in something or did take a bit of interest in a noise that was just down the drainage line. But she's relaxed back down again now and uh, has gone flat. So we've got flat cats on both sides, but it's great to know where they are, and particularly because Karula has... This, uh, the rest of her carcass in this tree right next to us. So I think uh, we're just going to wait for another vehicle. Uh, one of the other vehicles has just radioed in and like to join us and I'll just l probably give them this position just for the simple reason is um, that's the carcass there VM's got, the remnants of it. It's got a little bit of a feeds left on it so uh, she is looking after it and they're hanging around in this area but uh, we might pull out and give another vehicle an opportunity to uh, get a, her visual because she's in a very tricky position. There's only a space for one vehicle where we are. Um, our vehicle has the ability to get in some of the tightest spots uh, because it's so small and, and dinky and sort of can turn on a 20 cent piece. Um, whereas a lot of the other safari vehicles are extended and to fit a lot of people on them. So we do have a little added advantage there, but I would like to give uh, Taxon, I think, is coming at the opportunity to get in here and see this for his guests as well, because she is spectacular. She is just sitting there, lying there, chilling out, resting. Deborah, your question about do lions or uh, leopards ever kill hyenas for food? I wouldn't necessarily say I've seen them kill them for food. I've definitely seen them kill them out of uh, aggression or protection or the battle that they are eternal enemies, particularly lions and hyenas, and on a separate level, uh, leopard and hyena. Um, but we do have a situation where if they do kill them, I mean, there's been so many different stories, Deborah, about kill them and just leave them, some kill them and eat them or some drag them around. There's all different types of stories, but for food, I would say no. Hyena may kill a leopard and eat it or a wild dog or a lion cub or something like that, uh, and that has happened before. But um, normally they would prefer to particularly evade that uh, potential risk uh, the leopards and escape um, lion it will be a matter of a numbers game it really is you know we've seen leopard hugely power I'm um, sorry wahaina a hugely powerful animal um, up against some wild dog but the, le the hyena was outnumbered so the hyena just took off and was completely on the on the back foot against these uh, 
he's um, wild dog. Now, if it would have been the other way around, it would have been pretty much the same. So, uh, yeah, great question, Deborah, and thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. So we're just, she's just put her head up, um, just whilst the other vehicle just turns up. And I just had to take a couple of pictures of her, because I do love this cat. <laughs> I do love this cat a lot. And uh, when she looks at you like that, it's a bit hard to resist uh, taking a photograph of her. Um, so what I'm going to do is, she is flat, I'm going to just let Taxon uh, come down into here uh, and I'm going to give him the, just letting me talk to him on the radio just for a second please. Taxon, Taxon, do you copy? Taxon, Taxon, do you copy? I will pull out of this position here for you, mate, to get a better uh, better angle because it really is the only spot you can see her properly. So just stand by and I'll come out and let you in. So, folks, what we're going to do is, um, with good manners, um, we've had a lovely little sighting. She's flat and I think she'll probably stay like that for some time. The cubs are over there. Uh, we might get a little picture of the cubbies if we're lucky, but I just want to get out of here gently. We're on a pretty steep angle here, but Wendy, who is like my old horse, uh, always performs beautifully. Clear to go back there, Viam? You'll, you'll probably have to come up and so I just let Texan in uh, to that little spot. She's just down in that drainage line, Tex. But you have to get your no you have to reverse down, I think, mate. Here's, here's me telling Tex how to drive. Yeah, sure. <laughs> A man's been in the bush for probably ten times longer than I have. He's an amazing guy. But I tell you what, he will worry about his shiny Land Cruiser, <laughs> that beautiful beast. Now, I'm going to just try and just have a little look around this side here and see if we can see the cubs. <coughs> um, but bear with me, I've just got to manoeuvre. don't really want to drive over as very little vegetation as I possibly can here. Um, the tree, the little ones, the little saplings here that I'm driving over will bounce back. I also don't want us to get a puncture. Mm, it's tricky. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. That really sharp one under there, VM. That's got puncture written all over it, that one over the end there. Let's try and go around this way. Just gently, gently. Whoa. Come on, gently, gently. Thank you. So they are just down in there. They're asleep. They're very calm. They're very relaxed, folks. And just for, if anyone's watching for the first time and you think that, um, you know, we're invading their privacy, these animals have been with us for such a long time. Well, the cub's only seven months, but Karula knows that we are so not a threat to her. We've seen her do everything from hunt to raise her babies, raise so many babies, she's completely relaxed. Can you see there, V? Is it just through? It's not very good, is it? Look, folks, I'll tell you what, I think the most important thing is that we know that they're there, we know that they're okay, and I don't really want to harass them uh, or move into their zone where they actually get disturbed. So, And we're going to have to sort of bump into some bushes and make a little bit of a ruckus to get any closer. So let's just leave them and uh, let them be. I think it's the wisest and most respectful thing to do. So after my 50 point turn getting out of here, we'll just let them be. And we know they're there and we'll come back afterwards. 
and just gently go over these sharp, oh, gently, 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 very sharp sticks sticking out. Right, and we'll move on. Okay, I think that was a great, great sighting of Kurula. We should know she's there. We know that the Just got a lovely question from Deb in Ohio. Fantastic to talk to you, Deb, and thank you for the lovely welcome back. Um, it is great to be back. It's only a short time, and what has brought me back here is um, the school sessions that uh, we have got in the mornings at the moment that I sort of put together this collaboration between Wild Earth and the zoo that I'm working at in Australia, Taronga Zoo, or the Taronga Conservation Society, that, that actually is a behaviour change organisation that manages two zoos, one in our, our Western Plains Zoo that is an absolutely magnificent place with a big open plain zoo, and our, <coughs> our city zoo, which has been there for a hundred years and uh, is having its centenary year this year. So I was trying to get a hundred schools together to be able to tune in in the mornings to see Safari Live, little dwarf mongoose ran across there then. Do you think we're going to see him? No, I think he's going to scoot. Oh, I think he's going to stay, or is he going to scoot? Yeah. Oh, there's another one there. Oh, there's a few here. Let's just stop and... Oh, this is good. This is a great, lovely little... Deb, I'm definitely going to come back to you right now. I just want to see if we can uh, just watch these mongoose for a little, a little second. I promise you, Deb, I'll come back to you very, very shortly. And... Uh, see if we can just let these guys settle with us because um, once we we settle with dwarf mongoose they end up actually just interacting between themselves and they really do uh, have a great little time they're great fun to watch and they're just going about foraging at the moment enjoying themselves uh, it's a lovely lovely sunny afternoon so they're just foraging around these little bits of bark and tree and all different uh, all different sort of habitats there and foraging for anything they possibly possibly can get their hands on. They're such a adaptive cat, um, adaptive mongoose, sorry. Uh, they would really have a go at anything. They're, they're active, busy, busy little guys. They'll be looking for small reptiles, insects, anything they possibly can. And whilst they're doing that, they're also giving little contact calls with each other, which is incredibly important. I'm watching loads of them up there scurrying around, just looking at looking through different different uh, areas. And sometimes you'll have hornbills trailing behind them, also benefiting from their little foraging activities. They might try and steal a little bit of food from them or or something. And they're just so fantastic to watch. Really, really cool creatures. And once they do know that you're, um, you're not a threat to them, they'll start to relax. So I'm just looking for some hornbills. There normally is. There's a couple over here, but there's a couple of little busy guys. There's one just over here foraging Vim. Just Can you see him just on the other side of those trees there? So small. Very, very difficult to see. But there's a lovely, lovely hornbill. Yeah, there's a couple scurrying through there. I really love, love these mongoose. There's some lovely sort of uh, symbiotic relationships here with, with um, hornbill. And, and sometimes, you know, it's been, the studies have shown that it, it can be the same hornbill uh, following the same mongoose on a daily basis. But they will, a great little relationship there. More eyes in the sky, more eyes looking for predators, and both benefiting from each other's little diggings. Let's just see if we can find another mongoose a bit closer to us. They're a little bit far away at the moment. Scurrying along up the back there. 
No, it's just a little bit too far for VM to, to show you. We can see them, but a little bit far away. Sometimes it's a bit like showing the bird in the tree. Uh, the bird in the tree that looks beautiful, we know what it is, but through the lens it can just look like a backlit black dot. So we'll move on. So Deb, back to your question. I do apologise. I uh, had a little segue, a mongoose segue in the middle there. <coughs> and so I got offered a uh, position back there, Deb. Uh, I went for the job. It was just too good to refuse. It's a wonderful position. I, it's the zoo that I started at uh, nearly 25 years ago. Uh, as a zookeeper on African Mammal Division there and I left there in about 1998 and I went to Africa and carried on and then ended up in the United Kingdom after I chased a wonderful woman who is now my wife um, which is great and it all worked out beautifully and then just this job just came up and well, it wasn't, really wasn't thinking about going back to Australia, but it just is too good to miss this opportunity. So the position is um, I manage all the people and wildlife uh, and guest experience at the zoo. So anyone that walks into the zoo, it's, it's my team's job, and I've got a wonderful team there, uh, to give people an unforgettable experience and take, so it's a beginning, uh, middle and end sort of story, so it's a message that they need to, we need to get to them to take home with them on behaviour change, how they can change their behaviours or their, their thought patterns about the planet, and, and really, really great position, so it's given me a great opportunity to make change and, and help people understand more about the planet. But also, it's a great opportunity for me to, for me to get Safari Live into Australia and uh, Safari Live into more people around the world because I'm a huge champion of Safari Live and uh, there's no stopping me when it comes to that. So, I won't bang on any more about that, but uh, I'll probably write a little bit about that when I finish here next week and give you a bit more information if you want to follow up on anything that I do there. So we're going to cross over to Jamie again now because she's with Lions. So that's a lot more interesting than listening to me banging on while we drive on and try and find some... I'd really like some elephants. So let's see what we can do. We'll see you just now. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. We do have our lions with us. But we also had some Ritz's helmet trike, and I was about to tell you how Safari Live is full of excitement and how excited I was to be able to show those birds to you. But they're gone now. That's okay. They'll be back again one day. I'm going to try and wipe away the tears that are falling from my eyes and struggle on. I just got very excited because we always show you the white crested helmet shrikes and it's not often we get to show you the Reds as helmet shrikes. And they're just fluttering, they're just being awkward and poor Zander was doing a marvellous job of putting them on camera right up until the point that Hayden sent you across to us. Not that our lions aren't lovely, and terribly exciting, but at the moment they're very sleepy and those birds were very active. I have to tell you though, at some point I think perhaps the elephants might decide to come and join us. I keep hearing branches breaking and cracking away. And I can't help but wonder when that might mean that we have visitors. But while you've been with Hayden, I've been contemplating my options here in terms of where I can move. I have to tell you though, there aren't many. There's, there's no real way that I can improve your view. Ah, oh, man, but time spent with these lions, even if they are partially hidden behind the trees, is still a wonderful way to spend some time. And we, the time that we have spent with them is going to be short-lived. So there are other vehicles that would like to get into the sighting, and once they reach here, then we will move out and let them have a turn, and then we shall come back here as it starts to get dark. The difficulty is, of course, that with their cubs, we can't follow them in the dark. Our time with them is limited. And I'm sorry again. I, Debbie, I will get to your question in one moment. I just have to chat to Mike on the game drive comms. Oh, never mind. I was dilly-dallied too long, and I've lost my chance. There's now another conversation happening. <laughs> sorry. So Debbie, in Vancouver, you were wondering about how close the sticks are to the Inkuhumas and what perhaps would happen if they happen to meet each other. I don't know where the sticks are at the moment. They were on Hoffman's this morning, which is, they are probably about, 
I don't know, that, that's about five odd kilometers away. You can do the conversion to miles because I have to be honest, my mile kilometer conversion is truly appalling. And Debbie, I'll go a bit further on to, no, I've lost my chance again, never mind. What would happen if they met? Well, there'd be some conflict between the two of them. Sorry, Mike has gone to the wrong road and he can't, he can't find them. <laughs> Um, he wonders, or he can't understand why he can't find me, but that's because he's on the wrong road, so I really have to get hold of him, I'm sorry. Just bear with me one moment. Oh dear. Again I've lost my opportunity. Sorry, Debbie. My answer's been choppy because I haven't been able to think clearly. Um, the answer to your question is, in terms of what would happen if they were to meet, the Nkumas and the Sticks meet on the odd occasion. The last time that we knew of, the Nkumas chased the Sticks away from around the eastern boundary of the, or close to the Kruger National Park, actually, the eastern boundary of the Slavi Sands. The, the Sticks are outnumbered. The thing about lionesses is that they are territorial and they do chase each other away every now and again. However, they're usually quite good at keeping out of each other's way. And one of the reasons why we've been so spoiled, I feel, with the Inkuhumas is because they're still denning their cubs. They're see keeping them right in the heart of their territory. Woohoo! Let me grab this opportunity quickly. Mike, Mike. Mike, you were trying to call me earlier. I'm on Gallagher Shortcut, south of Miskaya. I uh, will do. You'll definitely see me from the road, though. Right. Back to the Sticks and the Nkuhumas. And the Sticks and the Nkuhumas have got a little bit confusing because <laughs> there's actually, there's eight Sticks cubs and there's eight Nkuhuma cubs. We haven't seen all eight Nkuhuma cubs together. We have seen all eight of the Sticks cubs together. There was a report, and I think some of you may have picked it up on social media, that two of the Styx cubs were missing as of this morning. That, at this point, doesn't mean anything terrifying just yet. It could well be, because it's the two youngest ones, it might just be that Mom actually really got tired of them tagging along and messing up the hunts and just went and put them somewhere safe. Basically stashed them away in a drainage line like we've been watching our Uncle Humas doing to keep them out of the way, to keep them away from danger, and just because for her it is a much, much easier approach to do. So no panicking just yet, because of course the injured Nkuhuma cub, it, it belongs to this pride, not to the Sticks pride. If it had been a missing stick, uh, missing Nkuhuma cub, I'd be a bit more concerned. If our limp, if our poor little limping cub had been the one that was missing, I would have been far more concerned. But for now, no reason to panic. I'm sure that they are okay. I think she's just hidden them away to go hunting. But we'll, it remains to be seen. So the Sticks and the Nkuhumas, neighbours, and both, of course, dominated by the Birmingham boys, who are most likely the fathers of this little set of cuddly cubs that you can't see at the moment. They're there, I promise you. <laughs> <coughs> they are hidden away, but they are there. Amber Eyes is definitely there, and both of the older sets of Nkuhuma cubs is there as well. But for now, our lionesses are just enjoying a little bit of sunbathing time, and for once, peace and quiet. The cubs aren't climbing all over them or exhausting them. Although, that being said, I think the cubs have also had quite a tiring time. They've covered an enormous amount of ground over the last few days, from Buffles Hook all the way back towards Arethusa, then back here, Simbambili, then back here, hunting buffalo, then back towards Simbambili. Been a busy time for our ladies. They will most definitely be looking to try. I actually wondered in my own mind, and I mean I've got no reason to really think this, but there's a part of me that wondered if they wouldn't try and search for that buffalo that they nearly caught last night. I mean, James was telling me, or all of the crew actually were telling me, that it looked, it would be absolutely fine if it were left alone to recover from its injuries, it would be okay, but it would be weakened by shock and by loss of blood. Now, I've never heard of 
lions in this area following behind prey or animals that they started an attempt at hunting. But it wouldn't surprise me. That's Amber, or it was Amber Eyes. Am I confused now? I saw her when she got up. I think it is her. No apologies necessary, Paul, because I've just done a whole blurb on the sticks in the Inkahumas, and I would not at all have blamed you if you'd got a bit confused as to which lions we're looking at as opposed to talking to. This is the Inkahuma Pride. So it's the Inkahuma Pride with their five little cubs. The other three are still a little bit too young. As far as I can see, but it is a difficult area, but as far as I can see, there's four lionesses here and at least three cubs. So the Inkahumas, the Birmingham boys, at least one of them is with the sticks that are further to the south of Juma's boundary on a place called Hoffman's. Actually, let me just check that. Hold on one moment. Let me just check they were on Hoffman's or where else they might have been. <laughs> I have the message somewhere. Of course, we all share the different updates. Um. Oh, no, sorry. It was one of the Birmingham boys on Hoffman's. I'm not 100%. I think the sticks might have been on Chitwa. They're somewhere south of our boundary either way. And then one Birmingham boy that came up from Marla Marla, for those of you who keep track of the lion's movements. One of them came up from Marla Marla, limping a little bit. So they've been scrapping. But that means they're doing their jobs as the prospective fathers, or the actual fathers at this point, of several different little litters of cubs. It's their job to go and make sure that no male lion feels in any way that it can come barging into this area and attempting to take over the territory. And a lovely update from Big Dave, who said that perhaps we know this already, but that tomorrow is World Lion Day. And thank you, Big Dave. That is a wonderful update. We did, in fact, know that. However, I'm really hoping, as I'm sure you are as well, that perhaps our lion characters will show up for World Lion Day. But if they don't, then we can count this afternoon's sighting as in lieu of a World Lion Day lion sighting. Let's go and find out what Hayden is doing at the Juma Dam and what's happening on the camera. Well, it is a little quiet here, but it's still a lovely, lovely place just to sit and be. And I think that's one thing I really like to sort of share with people sometimes. Driving around all the time, you can have a tendency to just miss the moment now and again and not take in everything, all the soundscape, the, the landscape. And you also have the opportunity for animals to come to you. Um, we've just got some impala, a small herd of impala making their way across the uh, remnants of where Juma Dam does flow into. It's very, very dry down there, but they're just, they may be making their way up here to this water. And if I do start to see them coming up this way, I'll um, definitely move on because they might not be as comfortable uh, with us being this close to the water's edge. They're pretty cool. Um, they're very, very relaxed, but uh, they can be a little bit skittish around, around water holes. So elephants are a little bit different. They've obviously got more confidence as a buffalo. But there's a couple of buffalo way, way off. vm has got uh, in, his, in his frame right there for you. They're a long way off. They look like they've actually been down to drink already and they're moving away. So this is the only sort of permanent water point, uh, or no, sorry, one of the two water points quite close to each other. There's one just here and there's one way, 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 way over that way behind uh, the lodge. And we do hear, often hear animals coming and drinking uh, at all different times of the day and night. Um, the other night we heard a buffalo being uh, severely harassed by lion, but uh, the buffalo got away, and it is the I think it's pretty much the the pride that um, that uh, Jamie is with right now. Uh, so we are still waiting. They're hungry, as Jamie said, so anything could happen over the next 24 hours, which is very exciting always. So we just sort of thought we'd sit here for a second. We'll probably move on, uh, but it is sometimes just a lovely place just to sit and observe. And I think, folks, if I can ever share anything with you about going into any wild area, 
Try just to stop for five minutes and breathe and just look and listen. Just take it in and not necessarily have to be entertained by, you know, all the, the big species, but just really take note of the small things as well. And even if there's not a lot around, uh, silence is actually something quite very, very special as well. It really is. Just got a lovely question from Ben, who's 14, and great to have you with us, mate. Uh, a great question. Was it very difficult to drive this vehicle in the bush? Well, I think any off-road driving, you do have to have a, uh, a certain sort of sense of what works and what doesn't work. Um, sand versus mud versus harder terrain, um, knowing your vehicle's capabilities, Ben. But uh, also having respect for your vehicle, because... Uh, these things are very precious to us and we treat them like um, we put them in their stables at night and we rug them up and we look after them and every single time we drive them we check all the the fluids and the tires and everything but they do get uh, they do put us into incredible positions these are our tools of our job uh, and if you don't look after your tools you definitely don't do a good job but it was tricky these these Land Rovers just turn on such a small turning circle. They're absolutely amazing. It is the most incredible vehicle in the bush. Uh, so you're always learning from it. You you don't push too hard because you know things will happen, and you also have to take have respect for the for the landscape. But you obviously um, just look after your vehicle, look after the landscape, and learn every day. I'm constantly learning, Ben, and I don't think anyone that says that they know everything about driving in the bush uh, is telling the truth. Uh, I think you have a constant learning curve in life with everything, mate, and uh, I learn something new every day. And by the way, folks, I have done something incredibly rude, <coughs> and I do apologise for it, and my boldness in uh, just going, forging ahead this afternoon, Karula, Karula, Leopards, the story and everything, and I forgot to tell you one of the most integral parts of this vehicle, well, he's not a part of the vehicle, but he's on the vehicle with me, and that's the wonderful Viam, who is right there, behind there, also commonly known as the Wildebeest. And uh, Viam and I haven't had a drive together for about seven or eight months, so this is quite an exciting drive for me, and, Every time I drive with VM, it's the wildebeest luck. He has spotted things for me sitting up there. I used to call VM my eyes in the sky because we have been driving along Buffalo Sook Road, not too fast, but fast enough that I, you know, I wanted to get to another location. And VM's gone, stop, stop, and just saw out of the corner of his eye a tail flick up. I can't remember what pride it was, VM, can you? It was the Incahumas, was it? Wow, well, it was probably our, my first time to meet the Incahumas, and uh, they were lying just off the edge of the road, but all flat, in, and really, really long grass, and uh, he just saw a tail flick up, and we sat with those lines for the next two days on a buffalo kill. So if Viam didn't see that, I wouldn't have had that experience. He is amazing. So, on that note, talking about someone amazing, uh, I am going to cross over to Jamie Patterson and see what she's up to while we go to our next location and try and find some more critters. We'll see you just now. What a lovely introduction from Hayden. And it is so wonderful to have him back on the team once again. Now, our little lion cub, right up until kind of like our Retz's helmet shrikes that we saw earlier, right up until the point that Hayden sent you across onto the back of Rusty, was looking straight at us, it's now decided to play hard to get behind the thorns. She's terribly inconvenient, little lion cub, but giving us a beautiful... Oh, hello. There you are. Hello, gorgeous. Pale, almost olive-green eyes. And I don't r really know why I've never noticed this before. Oh, giving us a glimpse of those fearsome teeth. Aren't you terrifying? Terrifying predator. I don't know why I've never noticed before just how disproportionate lion cub ears are compared to the rest of them, but they're huge. They look absolutely enormous compared to their faces. Oh, don't you start scratching. 
Sorry, that, that's a reference that only those of you who've been watching the Styx Cubs will understand. The Styx Cubs have got some kind of terrible skin infection that's making them very, very uncomfortable, whether it's a fungus or it is mange, something that the Inkahuma Cubs have completely escaped. And I'm hoping that they don't... There's a lot of theories bouncing around as to what it is. Um, and, of course, we've got one of the Birmingham boys, so one of the males that these cubs often associate with has a skin disease. And we're hoping that the Nkuma cubs don't pick it up from one of them as well. Hence why I told the cub not to scratch, although, of course, lions have their own share of parasite fleas and ticks and all kinds of things that climb into that thick, beautiful fur and manage to lodge themselves in there. Little lion cub, you're playing hidden behind the thicket. And George H? Um, the answer to George H is never say never. So George H's question is, is that I know, George says he knows that I've mentioned what would happen if the Nkumas and the Sticks would meet, but is there no possibility of them merging into one? And, George, the answer is next to nothing. The reason I'm... Oh, hello, number two. Didn't even know you were there. <laughs> Little lion heads popping up all over the show. Uh, George H., I did... I, I don't want to say never, because strange things happen out here in the bush. The animals don't read the textbooks, and sometimes, like strange males being accepted into odd coalitions or prides... Just waving hello to everybody. So I don't want to say never, but the chances are pretty much next to nothing that that will ever happen. So there might be a time, if you go back far enough, that the Styx and the Inkuhumas were in some way related to each other. New lion prides are often formed by either prides getting too large and splitting off, or during a pride takeover when the males come in and the females with young cubs actually run away and then remain separated from the rest of the pride. You can see them just looking back at where Mike is coming into the sighting. So listening, it's amazing how they've become so, so used to the vehicles. Hey, little one, there's another one. Three of you there. So, George, it's possible but highly unlikely, and most of the time when pride split, they remain split. The only time that they really come together and move apart is when you get that, those cases where you get pr lion prides of up to 40 members. And then they'll often m merge and come together and then separate because they can't all feed off the same meal. One buffalo doesn't go very far amongst 30 different or, yeah, 30 different or 40 different lions. The sticks won't merge with the female. The, one of the things that makes female prides such a strong unit, or lion prides, because that of course was tautology, Lion prides, such strong units, is the level of connection that the lionesses have with each other. So whilst a male coalition can be made up of unrelated lions, male lions, a female pride, their bonds are built upon the genetic connection that they have with each other, this connection, this bond that they form, even as tiny little cubs with their mothers and their aunts. And Abu Sheikh, you wanted to know which is the biggest pride of this area. And let's move away from our little cubs for now and just have a look at our adult lionesses while we chat about this. Abu Sheikh, the answer to that, the biggest pride in this area um, is that we see is the Mangeni pride. And they have somewhere in the region of 14 lions. Those are the ones that we could see. And we've only seen a few of them at a time. And most of them are sub-adults. The Mangens are also known as the Tsalala breakaways. That at least is in the northern Sabi sands that we might see on our live safaris. There are larger prides. There's a pride of lions, which of course it counts as this area because they are the space from us to where they are is unfenced. The mountain pride, they've got different names, but they're up towards Singita Limbombo on the eastern side of the Kruger National Park, they have up to 40 lions. I just want to chat to Mike in a second, just bear with me. Mike? 
Mike. Yeah, this side. Mike. Uh, I'll move you guys in a moment so you can come take the spot. So, the, as I mentioned earlier, this area is really, really tricky. So, for all of us, we have to basically shift around and give up the best viewing that we have. And I think that might be our time to do that. Our lionesses are sleeping for now. I promise we will try and come back as soon as Taxon and Aubrey and Ephraim have come into the sighting. Then we will make our way back in once again. We are going to leave our lionesses for now, but we will return to them. Fingers crossed we will return to them before the end of the afternoon. In the meantime, it sounds like HT has found one of his favorite animals. So let me take you back about 30 to 50 million years. And there was these creatures that were sort of deer-like, but they had longer necks. And then go fast forward about 50 million years from where we were, and seven to eight, eight nearly 10, I think, generations or fossil genera, and we've got this. How cool is that? How cool is that? An absolutely perfect specimen. Absolutely amazing beauty in that male southern giraffe. So there used to be a creature that roamed the earth, which is the forefather of this creature right here, called the Helidotherium. And it was um, a deer-like creature. It didn't have as long a neck. And as time went on, uh, that neck evolved and got longer and longer, and it allows the giraffe to exploit a, a pocket of vegetation there that only one other creature can exploit as well, and that's the, the elephant. So these guys are just perfectly designed to exploit that, uh, that area of vegetation. But you know what? I've seen them all over Africa doing things from reaching with the longest stretch of their neck and their tongue that they possibly can to widening their legs as if they're drinking and eating small sedges off the ground when vegetation has been very scarce with desert giraffe out in uh, the west of Namibia. So this is the southern giraffe and very distinct dark markings and you know the, the, it does it does sort of uh, correlate with age. The giraffes generally do get, particularly the males, get a little bit darker with age. Not always but uh, most of the time they do but I don't know if VM can zoom in, yeah, right on the chest there. I'm just going to have a look through my binoculars. And if you can see, folks, it's very difficult. I can't quite see through the monitor, but right where VM is, there's about four or six, I can see six, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight scratch marks right just where the, the shoulder meets the neck. And he has had a, a, a near-death experience with line by the looks of things. He's got scars to prove it right across his chest. This boy is one of the most beautiful male giraffes I've seen in a long time. He's still got incredible health, incredible vigor. He has been motionless there for, I don't know how long, probably five minutes, all the time you've been with Jamie since we drove off from uh, that water point. This giraffe has just been standing motionless. Now, that tells us something else. He may be looking at a predator because he was looking like this when we arrived. And he has not taken his eyes off at this location over here. So we're not really sure what's going on. And we are going to sit here and just monitor this. But uh, he has had the experience before. He knows what he's doing to do. He's gotten to this ripe old age. But look at the beautiful markings on this creature, will you? That is such an extraordinary uh, individual. I'm just blown away with how beautiful those patterns are on the front of him there. So we're looking at a creature that has a supercharged heart. And you know, you've heard all the stats about the length of the neck and the tight height and everything, but I just want to talk about it. Every time we see giraffe, I like just to talk about it, something a bit different. That supercharged heart weighs up to about, I think they've been recorded at about 11 kilograms. And if I'm going to convert that quickly, and you know how great I am at this, um, into pounds, it's about 25. I've had people say to me before, why don't you just get an app? You've got apps for everything else, just get a conversion app, and I should do it, folks. I promise you I'll try and do it, get along to do that. But it pumps blood around that body. It's about 
And these are pretty, so not gruesome, but these are stats that I can't imagine that you'd be f wanting to hold a giraffe's heart, but they get to about 60 centimetres or about two feet long, the heart itself, which is pretty incredible in its size. Now that pumps about 60 litres or about 100 pints of blood around the body every minute. I mean, seriously, folks, that is one supercharged, supercharged heart. It really does blow my mind that it can, it can pump that sort of blood around the body in one minute, 100 pints of blood around the body in one minute. So these guys are living legends. They are superb creatures. And a lot of people think, oh, look, they just stand there and do a bit of browsing and so on. But I have a lot of time for these guys. And you have just been spectacular, mate. You have waited there till I finished my little talk, and we will let you move on. Isn't he spectacular? Wow. Just love it. Oh, goodness me, that has made my day, guys. That has made my day. Seeing that giraffe, I've been wanting to see giraffes since I've been here. And uh, if, I can, if I can steer you in any, any direction of looking further about giraffe, the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, have a look online. Um, I'm highly involved with that, and it's based in Namibia and is the sort of, the, well, not the sort of, it is the leading body uh, looking after giraffe on all over Africa. I'm just going to move up a little bit, give VM a bit of better shot here. Um, Kat in Tampa, hello Kat, lovely to have you with us, really great to, to have you on board. And uh, your question is, is there a way to tell how old a giraffe is? Well, you can normally tell from their condition, um, older males and even sometimes the females, they will lose their condition a little bit. They'll get a bit bony around their hips and their shoulders. Uh, they will go through their teeth, not like an elephant, but they will wear their teeth down a little bit. But uh, it's normally just age. And what happens is uh, you'll get that sort of visual recognition from them that they are. He's off now, down into the drainage line, which is interesting. That's very interesting. He's gone right behind that jackalberry there. So sometimes you can tell just from their condition. The males, particularly uh, those ossicones on their head there, which you know some people call, call horns, they're skin-covered, uh, skin sorry, bony structures that when they're born, they're flattened to their skull and they stand up between two and three weeks of age. They don't actually connect or fuse to their skull properly until they're between four and seven years of age. I've got a giraffe skull, um, well, we've got a giraffe skull back at... Uh, at DRC where we stay and we have used it many a time in the tent um, but I'll try and bring it on board and show you uh, this week if we get a chance maybe tomorrow afternoon's drive um, and go through the skull a little bit with you and that skull is uh, is a real interesting talking point but um, they will lose the hair on the top of that as well and that's another little uh, indication I've got a uh, question from Caroline here. I'm just going to pause before I answer your question, Caroline, because we might lose a little bit of signal just here. So please bear with me. Okay, fantastic. Signal is perfect. Thank you, Control. Thank you, Bex. Bex, can you just repeat where Caroline was from, please? I missed that. Okay, Caroline uh, is on YouTube, and hi there. Thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, great to have you on board. You want to know the size of a giraffe's brain. Is it comparative to its body size? Well, I'd probably say not as if you were thinking uh, like an elephant or something like that. Elephants have got an incredibly large brain, a lot of convolutions to their brain, which convolutions are those little sort of squiggly bits that you see in a brain and the more convolutions supposedly I'm not a neurologist or a scientist that knows much about brains that's for sure but all I know is that uh, the more convolutions there there are supposed to be in there uh, 
is supposed to have a more developed brain or a more capable brain. So, look, I've never seen a giraffe's brain, um, but what I have know, I do know, is that they are an incredibly immense animal, and they do have a reasonably small size head for their body size. I think. Uh, look, I'm going to be very fair to giraffes. They've exploited an incredible little niche uh, and are very successful. But the numbers of giraffe are very, very. Uh, I think a lot of people in the world think there's a lot more of them because we see them in all the pictures of Africa, they're one of the iconic species, giraffe walking across the sunset and all that sort of thing. There's just over 90,000 giraffe left on the continent uh, and some spe subspecies that are very, very highly threatened and two have actually been classified as endangered, okay? So it's really worth going on to the Giraffe Conservation Foundation website, giraffeconservation.org, and you'll get all the information you need to know there, Caroline, and I highly recommend it. I champion that organization because of the amazing work that them, us, we are doing to uh, protect giraffes and give all giraffes in the wild uh, a, a, a really, really safe place to live. So uh, they're not that responsive when it comes to working with them in captivity. They're, they're pretty happy with the feed and some water and uh, doing their thing, you know. But uh, I'm not really sure. I've never seen a giraffe's brain, but I think it's not the biggest for their body size, that's for sure. That's a diplomatic, nice way of saying it. Now, this is a brilliant question. Absolutely brilliant. Tula Ann, I think I've got the name right, have I, Control? Just share that with me again. Tula Ann, who is four years of age, how fantastic it is to have you on board, my friend. My goodness, and your favourite animal is the same favourite animal that I have, giraffe. Wow, we've already got something in common, buddy, so therefore, you're already my friend. Great question. I tell you what, a lot of people think this too, you know. Do giraffe knock down trees with those big long necks? Well, I tell you what, I don't think they knock down the really big trees, but I have seen them going through trees, running when they've been trying to get away from something, and they can knock over small trees and bash through that brush because they're really, really big animals. If you think of your mum or dad's car or someone you know's car, a small size car, not a real big one, but a small size car, they weigh about one and a half times one of them a big, big male. So that's a really, really big animal to be white rushing the bush. They probably knock down small trees, but not the big ones, not like elephants, Tula Ann. But what a great question, and how incredible to have you watching as well, my friend. Wow, you're amazing. Great, great favorite animal too, Tula Ann, giraffes. How cool is that? And you're watching, this is just great. I've got a question from Vanessa Page about do giraffes travel alone? And the only reason I'm stopping here, folks, each time I answer, because just down in here is the notorious black spot where I normally lose everyone. So I'll answer your question, Vanessa Page, before I, uh, I go. Do giraffes normally travel alone? Definitely not. Um, they're not as, as tight as a herd of elephants, that's for sure. They work, they live in loose herds, that, that's what we call transient. So sometimes a herd will come together with another one. The bulls sometimes uh, live a, a very solo existence. They may come into a herd to mate with a female uh, when she is in season or in mating season uh, for her. Uh, but a lot of the times the males will be seen solitary and they will trail a herd when there's a female uh, ready to mate. And yeah, it's it just depends on where they are but i'll tell you what whilst i go through this we're going to go over and see what jamie's up to and i'm sure she's still with those beautiful cats we'll see you just now unfortunately we've had to leave the lions just because there was no way that mike's guests were ever going to be able to get a view without us moving out of their way first. So we've left the lions for now, giving everybody else another opportunity to have a look at them. And fingers crossed we will have some time before it gets too dark to go back and see them before the end of the sunset safari. As our regular viewers know, but perhaps our newer viewers don't, we don't view cubs after dark. That is the standard rule. We will when they're a bit older, but at the moment they're still young, fluffy and vulnerable. 
and they don't need the extra distraction of the spotlight in their lives as it starts to get dark. So we're trundling along on a warm winter's afternoon because it is of course 74 degrees Fahrenheit which is 25 centigrade to see what's happening at the various water holes. And first on the list is Sydney's Dam. All is quiet here at Sydney's Dam, I think. Always pays to stop and check though. You never know who might be hiding in the shade and cat spots are quite deceptive. Anybody here? I don't think so. I was under doing a marvellous check because of course my binoculars are broken which is devastating and I will be getting a new pair when I go on leave. Or at least trying to get mine fixed. Nothing hiding in the shade. Just some road graders attempting to hide or some diggers. <laughs> And I think, is that mud or hippo in that dam? That's a hippo, right? A hippo, or is it some mud with some... Ter hippo? Hippo, mud, mud. I can see the ter... No, it's, a, it's moving. It's a hippo. <laughs> there is a hippo with three passengers. <laughs> three terrapin passengers and one hippopotamus. It gets a bit more tricky when it's far away and you're looking across a dam, especially when the dam has started to dry out. Three terrapins. And a very, very warm welcome to a Pam VP. It is wonderful to have you on board, and I'm glad that you have discovered our live safaris. Now, Pam VP has asked us a question that is next to impossible to answer, which is how many animals do we get on our reserve? Well, uh, the reason I say it's next to impossible is because, of course, the, the description animals includes insects, mollusks, so we've got the crustaceans, the crabs that live in the dam, but, and reptiles and birds and all kinds of other things. But while we trundle along and look for some animals to show Pam, in answer to your question, let's start with the mammals. So we've got all of the big ones in terms of the African animals. We have about, we've counted up to well into the 20s in terms of antelope, different antelope species that you could see. Some are rarer than others, some we will get very, very excited if we see on our live safaris. We've got leopards and lions, obviously, because that's how we started off. We've got elephants and buffalo and cheetah and spotted hyena. One brown hyena that was seen once on the live safaris. And there are a whole host of nocturnal creatures and some of the lesser known creatures. I was just telling Zanda that we're right up close to where we saw the African wildcat the one day and actually spent most of the sunrise safari with it. Honey badgers, porcupines, different species of mongoose as I saw you. I know you were with Hayden and the dwarf mongoose. We get white-tailed, banded, slender. I've said honey badger and porcupine civet, which is a very strange stripy creature. We have a whole textbook full of African mammals that we get to see out here. Scrub hair, jackals, this is the spot for jackals. We're going to keep looking out for jackals, which is basically our South African equivalent of a fox or a coyote. Wild dog, I can't believe I left, left that one off my initial list. The African wild dog or the African painted wolf. Beautiful, beautiful creatures, very exciting, critically endangered and something that we get very excited whenever we see them. But Pam, I couldn't begin to list all of the species. I know that some of our viewers not only keep a birding list, but also a list of all of the different species that we've seen. We've seen mumbas, black mumbas on our drive, spitting cobras, puff adders, worm slungs, all host of venomous and non-venomous snakes alike. Turtles, no, no turtles, sorry. Bad, bad Jamie, no turtles. Only t no tortoises, only terrapins and, and no, sorry, no turtles, only terrapins. Now I'm mixing myself up. Start this whole sentence again, go into the answer to Bulba Betty's question, which is that they thought that the 
reptiles sitting on top of the hippopotamus look like turtles. They are part of the Chelonian family. We don't get turtles here, and it's something that's become linguistically indistinct in certain areas of the world. Basically, turtles have come to mean anything from turtle, actual turtles to terrapins and tortoises. So a turtle, um, under the official description, has got flippers and it lives in water. A terrapin has got half-webbed feet and is capable of living in water and on land. A tortoise is a purely land-based animal. All of these are creatures with shells, chelonians. A land-based animal that we see, but usually only after the rain or in summer when we see them all the time and we get very excited about seeing them. I love tortoises. I think they're awesome little creatures. So that's the distinction. So those that were sitting on the hippopotamus were three terrapins, <coughs> excuse me, marsh hinge terrapins to be more precise, although it's difficult to see exactly, but that's the most common species that we get here. They're very, very smelly. I wouldn't advise picking them up. They're also, as opposed to our tortoises, which are purely plant matter eaters, the terrapins are ferocious little carnivores that will pick up freshwater mollusks and worms and bits of carcass as we had with the, the dead buffalo in Red Dam. All manner of things. And that's not even, Pam, to go back to your question, that's not even talking about our bird species. So you could see well over 300 on our live drives. Some of our viewers have got lists that number close to 260 odd birds that we've managed to get on camera. Now driving along, you, I don't know where all our animals are hiding. I was hoping to show you at least some of them. but they are all hiding away for now. We started off on such a good note with our lions and our leopards. I know I heard elephants though, somewhere around here. And there's always our jackal pair. We're going to keep searching. This is our favorite spot for our jackal pair. And I feel as though we haven't seen them in this area recently, which would be such a pity because I was getting quite excited that our side striped jackal pair might decide to establish a territory here. They will be looking for a den site soon. I'm almost getting to the point where the jackals will be having their pups, or some jackals will be having their pups which is something I have been dying to get on live safari, on the live safari experience since I started working for Safari Live. I would love to be able to share with you just how enormously cute a jackal pup truly is. I mentioned that I was going to go off in search of things coming across to drink, whilst at the same time staying close to those lions so that we can go back there later. But for now, Hayden has had a similar idea. He's made his way to Buffels of Dam, so let's see what's happening there. Well, no turtles or tortoises or even terrapins for that matter uh, up here at the moment. There may be some down in there, but uh, we definitely can't see them from here. There would definitely be terrapins uh, down around in there. It is very dry at the moment. There's the last remnants of very foul or rank water. There's not a lot of animals that would probably come down and drink that. They may, when times get really tough, uh, just little pools on the edges that don't have uh, the bacteria or, sorry, the, the, the algal bloom on it. But there's an algal bloom happening right across all that there. You will get elephant that will come down here and maybe mud bath. Uh, but I doubt the elephants are a bit fussy when it comes to water, so uh, at times have to be absolutely desperate for them to drink something like that. So we just thought we'd come up. It's always good to see because you never know what you will get here. You might get an animal that does want to uh, just have a little sip or a little tiny drink that doesn't need an incredible amount of water to maybe do it, but I am also interested to see something a little bit smaller than that. Uh, which I did come past yesterday to see and they weren't there. A beautiful little bird. 
and I'm not going to tell you too much about them until I can see if we can see them. But you know, I do love birds, and a lot of you I know love birds, and we love birds. It's really important that uh, we do include birds as much as we can. Uh, sometimes when I travel abroad, I forget, you know, I forget the names. I, you, you work in Australia for a while, you work in, oh, there's a lovely little diker that just shot across the road there, doing exactly what its name it describes it. Sorry, VM, that was really tricky to see. Diker in, uh, oh, there's just settled just there, VM. Can you, let me just move forward a bit. Just a little bit further forward, just behind that tree. It's just sat there. You can just see a little face looking at you right now. And it'll probably shoot off again. It's just um, having a little break itself. And uh, sorry about that, my friend. Right, and that little diker is living up to its name. When it shot across that road, it dives across as it runs and if I turn this off, sometimes when you turn the vehicle off, they just run. We'll give it a try. No, stayed there for a second. Beautiful little antelope, pretty little antelope. very carefully walking through there but as soon as it gets a fright and it uh, oh it's just browsing nicely that's lovely to see they don't often do this for us that's for sure they normally just take off beautiful little little uh, antelope I love them and I love them probably because you don't see them as much as uh, you see lots of the other antelope and the ones that you don't see you always want to see more of they're very, very pretty. They often get confused with uh, Steenbok at a glance. Okay, so we might just uh, move on, but we're going to link back to Frankly. Uh, fr frankly, <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Frankly, she's going to laugh when she hears me call her that. We're going, to leave. <laughs> We're going to connect, link, go back to Jamie even, Jamie Patterson. And she might be with Frankly somewhere around there. We'll see just now. <laughs> Gosh. I'm oh, Jamie. <laughs> I'm sorry. There was some, some serious miscommunication happening and some um, very funny moments that happen here out here. So if you ever needed some, any proof that this is indeed live, then you only need to watch us for a couple of shows and you'll get the idea whenever something funny happens and we get to the giggles. I blame Hayden for this mood because he started off the afternoon by showing us a whole load of clips of various presenters losing control of themselves and getting the giggles, which of course set us off in a very merry mood. Right, our Frankies, I mean Franklin. We have here our Cokie Franklin, which I have to confess is one of my favorites. I think it's the orange head. It immediately identifies them and sets them apart from the other Franklin species. Part of the spur fowl family. These guys were so beautifully out in the open, they're now playing hard to get and making Zander work hard to get them on camera, but he is doing a fantastic job as they sit about in their little family group, picking their way through the different, or for the different grass seeds and whatever else they can find here. Definitely one of the most striking Franklins that you can see on a live safari. So, actually, for those of you who've been building up your birds lists since the start of this afternoon's sunset safari, we've had Ritz's helmet trike, we've had Koki Franklin, all going exceptionally well. And I'm positioned here just because we are just on the main road, which means that I can't, every time I try and go on to get a better view of our Koki Franklin, they start to move off into a more difficult position.
It's also a bird that is very, very easily identifiable by its call because it says its own name. Koki, Koki. It is spelt C-O-Q-U-I, by the way. Koki Franklin. We'll have a look at a picture. Most of the ones that we're seeing, actually, strangely enough, we've almost seemed to have a little bachelor group here. There's a female at the back. The male has a bright orange head. The female, on the other hand, is not nearly so identify well, not nearly as easily identifiable. She's got stripy patches around the top of her head, rather than having that solid orange. So the one on the right is a male, the one on the left is a female, and both of them are playing really hard to get. <laughs> Cecilia, welcome on our sunset safari. Cecilia would like to know, she wonders how much Frankie's weigh. And they only weigh a couple of hundred grams, Cecilia, as far as I know. Let's go and find a better position so that we can see them a little better. <laughs> the Frankies. It's an amazing, amazing description. I think we should, I think we should call the f at least one of the Franklin that lives around our camp Frankie. Oh dear, they are playing hard to get. So Cecilia, <laughs> only a couple of hundred grams that we're looking at. Slightly heavier and stockier than the let's say something of a, what would be a similar size, a Birchall starling perhaps would be a similar length to a Cokie Franklin. The difference being, of course, that the Cokie Franklins are almost entirely ground-based. They can fly. But they are built slightly more compact than the rest of our passerine species. So these are basically what some people would know as game birds, although they're playing games with us at the moment, definitely remaining hidden from view. Still scuffling around. Oh, definitely our position not dramatically improved. <laughs> well done, Zander. I'm sorry I made you stump for the world's most difficult bird, playing games with us as they trot along. So that's the male with the orange head. The female has dark stripes running along the top of her crown and then from her eye. The Koki Franklin, also known as the Koki Frankie, which has a beautiful ring to it. And as our Koki Franklin disappear from view, let's jump back on board with Hayden, who has got one of my new favorite bird species. Well, from one beautiful bird to another, it's funny that uh, Jamie was looking at a lovely, lovely bird and we just happened to come to find one in ourselves as well, so great minds think alike. Have a look at this magnificent creature, absolutely delicious little owl. Look at him, will you? Oh my goodness, that is such a beautiful creature. That is a southern white-faced owl. And it's a beautiful, beautiful little bird that's just sitting there waiting for night to fall, looking, you could drive past it very easily and not even see that it's uh, in that tree. And I have to be completely honest with you, I got told that it was uh, in this tree, uh, so I'm not going to pretend that I discovered it myself and take the credit for it. Uh, one of the other guides announced it on radio earlier, and Jondre also drove past here yesterday with me and told me that there were... Uh, a pair in here or some juveniles in here. Now, they are juveniles. They're found uh, right across South, uh, the top of South Africa in Namibia, uh, Botswana. You'll get them in Zimbabwe as well and into Mozambique. They're a perfect little... Look at him. He's just opened his eyes. Oh, this one's just opened his eyes. VM, VM's just zooming in there now. Look at that. How cool is that? That is a beautiful bird. And they are juveniles because the, may the, the adults have got a much darker uh, plumage and these are just sort of transitioning into that, that sort of dark plumage at the moment. And they're, they're, they're small for now. They're probably, mm, 
only about the size of a school ruler, I'd say. A little bit maybe, just a bit under that, maybe, uh, to give you a bit of an idea. I'm probably a little bit in school mode from this morning still, but sometimes it's good to give you an indicator uh, about the length of it. So probably about four, ten inches, I'd say, if that. Gorgeous orange eyes when they become adults. They're a little bit more of a... Uh, a little bit more lighter in colour, yellow orange when they're when they're in um, this sort of juvenile stage, and they will go go much brighter orange. Beautiful, beautiful bird. I do love these birds. They've got a fantastic, fantastic face on them. I love how those sort of fringed black sort of rings around the discs, those are facial discs there where their eyes sit. But my friend, we are going to go and leave you now and uh, let you be. And we will drive up the road because I do have a little app here somewhere that I can... Sorry, sorry to disturb you. A little app here that I can play you a call of theirs. I don't want to do it near them because I don't want to give them any indicator that there might be another owl here and maybe disturb them. It's those sorts of things you have to really take into consideration when you're viewing wildlife. With all the technology that's around, and you know how much I love my gadgets and my technology, uh, sometimes when you've got uh, apps for birds and you do play the call, you can actually trigger a, uh, a territorial sort of uh, flight or disturbance where they might take off or they might feel a little bit threatened and if that led to a tragedy that would be awful. So we just move away from there. Just let me find this, this uh, on my little, my little app here. I've got my bird app here. Alright, there's a picture of him. There we go. That's what he looks like in full uh, plumage. Okay, I'm trying to get the shadow away for there for or on it so you can see it. Right, now let me just pull it down for a second, VM, so you don't go all blurry. And I'll just turn off for a second and just find the call, which is um, quite fantastic. Get my volume up. Sorry, folks, I should have had this prepared earlier. Get my volume up and... Come on. Isn't that beautiful? That's a sound that you hear it in the African night. I love that call. One more time. Oh, that's beautiful. So that's the little vocalization of the, uh, the southern white-faced owl. So, let's go and find something else. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, hats off. And that's what it's about. It's about sharing these little bits of knowledge about where these animals are so everyone can get a great look at them and it uh, becomes very, very, very nice afternoon. James Bear, I've just had a bit of a message through that we've just made the 200 and... Can, can you repeat, please, Bex, for me? Wow. 2,036 species you've seen since 2014. A round of applause to you, James. That is absolutely amazing. And the southern white-faced owl just was the 236th. Congratulations, mate. Thank you so much for letting us know that. That's absolutely brilliant. Sorry, Control, you'll have to repeat again for me. I've just got a little bit of a, a uh, tricky com. No, on this trip, James, you're just, uh, just getting a message from uh, Control that you'd like to know if I saw any of these species in Namibia. I didn't see uh, 
the southern white-faced owl over there, actually, I have to admit. Uh, did see some amazing raptors over there, though. Beautiful, um, I mean, it's a common raptor over there, pale chanting goshawk, but one of my favorites and always beautiful to watch. Uh, I saw a martial eagle when I was driving back early one morning, which was brilliant to see as well. Uh, and I also had the great privilege of seeing southern white uh, back vultures, Cape Griffin vultures uh, on the kill over there, and that was really quite special as well. So James, thanks so much for watching, and uh, whilst I'm just cruising down here with VM trying to look for some other interesting things, we're going to cross back over to the wonderful Jamie Patterson. We have stumbled upon this lovely herd of elephant, and I'm just going forward ever so slightly and very, very slowly so that we don't startle any of the individuals. Hello, little girl. Do you mind if I come a bit closer, just so we can see the others at the same time? That would be very nice. What did you find? Oh, yum. One of the youngsters has just managed to essentially uproot what is left of this bush willow and is now going about, about the delicate process of debarking it. It goes in one side and is slowly chewed in that rotate. Look at that, isn't that awesome? Rotating it and have a look at the way that it comes out on the other side at the same time. Is that as good as you thought it would be, little one? <laughs> I love watching the babies do this because they're not quite as good as the, as the adults are. The coordination isn't 100% there just yet. Kind of like toddlers and children using knives and forks. They don't do it quite so elegantly as adults might do. Takes a bit of, and there's some serious concentration on this elephant's face. Getting to the good bits of the bark, and then of course they don't quite have the jaw strength as they rotate around. And they're stripping off the cambium layer, and not after the bark that is in this tree, but after the nutrients that run through the cambium layer essentially the equivalent of the circulatory system in an animal in this case carries the sugar and the water and that is why our elephants have been so destructive at the moment destructive is perhaps the wrong word but they have in their own way been quite destructive they've definitely been spending a lot of time around the various camps and gardens they're desperate in a time of drought, to try and get as much nutrients as possible, and as such large animals, they need to eat constantly. And the trees are the only things that have nutrients in them at the moment. Now those of you who picked up on the gloopy white stuff around the eye of the elephant, and I, say, I call it gloopy because my friend Emma always, when she wipes our dog's eyes, she always calls it eye gloopies. But the, it's basically a waxy build-up that protects... Oh, wow, did you see that? Awesome view of the elephant's eye. A waxy build-up that protects the elephant's eye from any scratches or the dust that is constantly a, a presence during these winter months when we don't really get much in the way of rain. And an elephant sighting at the moment in the African bush is accompanied by a cacophony of breaking trees and branches. And I would say that when we come out of this drought period, we are going to see a change, even if it's very subtle, but we are going to see a change to the landscape. As they're forced to focus more and more heavily on the tree species, they're going to clear slightly more, create slightly more open patches of land. And if you think that one elephant will weigh between these, these are little ellies that we're looking at at the moment. They're still young, they're not fully grown. But an adult elephant weighs up to four or five tons. And then you factor in the, that they have to eat between 200 to 300 kilograms of food a day. And it gives you an understanding as to just how much they need to eat. And, oh, sorry, distraction. Somebody's been digging and is now having a glorious dust bath which is one of my favorite things to watch with elephants. Oh, as I said that, she changed her mind and decided to go back to feeding. She was throwing, throwing, there we go. Oh, look at that. I remain 
That was a huge one. That actually thumped as it hit her back. She's digging for roots and has decided, well, since I'm at it, I might as well throw sand over my back. Now that protects them from the African sun. A strong beating down upon their backs also catches any itches that they haven't been able to reach, perhaps parasites in their skin, flies, creepy crawlies, it just acts as a barrier. I also, I'm convinced that they do that because it feels nice, to be completely honest with you. I think elephants enjoy a good dust bath. Oh, sorry, I'm doing it again. It's right into the sun. Zander, can you get that little one? Oh, it was pushing over a tree. Oh, little one. Little boy. That's not, it's Benjamin. Isn't that Benjamin? No, it's too big for Benjamin. I got overexcited. Although that one does have a wrinkly. No, it is Benji. It is Benji, with his wrinkly forehead. Hello, Benji. Am I completely mad? I'm not, am I? Gosh, he's grown. Benjamin is called Benjamin after Benjamin Button. And it's because he looks old before his time, which was originally the name that Brent picked out for him. Brent and his, his naming of animals. Benjamin, who is a, has got a very wrinkly forehead. The most wrinkly forehead of any baby elephant I have ever seen. Yay! It is Benjamin. Oh, that's wonderful. He is such a little character. Keeping up with Mum. And the nice news is that they're actually moving towards quarantine clearings. So whilst the light is very difficult at the moment and I can't reposition just, the, just at the second to find us a better view, Hopefully, we will be able to get a closer view of Benjamin. Zander, have you ever seen Benji before? Okay, so this will be a first for Zander. Zander's just told me that he thinks, during his time spent in the bush over the last few days, that he feels as though elephants will be fast becoming one of his favorite creatures to see. Now, most of you know that for me, elephants are my absolute hands-down favorite animal to spend time with. Although it's a tough one. Oh, what's your mommy doing, little one? Does that look nice? Do you want some too? That is the equivalent of a child picking food off mom's plate. <laughs> Hello, Benjamin. Look at that wrinkly forehead. It's changing slightly. It's not, I don't know if it doesn't look so furry just because of the light. Absolutely lovely. Benjamin is fast becoming one of our most beloved baby elephant characters. For our new viewers, we spend an incredible amount of time with these wonderful creatures. And one or two individuals start to stand out, whether it's due to their, some kind of physiological feature or perhaps their characteristics or their characters. We get so many elephants wandering through. But there are a few of them that we keep track. My favorite is the two-thirds trunk elephant, the short-trunked fe short female. And I've come to really appreciate and enjoy. Oh, she finally get it, little one. That's basically just wood now. There's not even any bark. That's not going to be very nice for little baby teeth. Let's go, oh, I don't know, it's going to be so tricky. I think we can go forward a little bit to get a clearer view of Benjamin. My only concern in terms of repositioning is we're just going to give the school in front of us a fright if we push it too far, so I'm just going to let the engine run. Benjamin's helping us out by doing some repositioning with us. as good as we get for now. And Dina, absolutely I think that he could be teething. And it's a very, very good suggestion. And it's only around six months of age that elephants 
babies properly start to eat solid food. Up until then, they are entirely dependent upon their mother's milk. And they will, in fact, remain dependent on their mother's milk for a considerable period of time after that. But they do teeth. They get their milk teeth in their first couple of months, so it's more than possible because of the way that elephant teeth come in, almost like a conveyor belt from the back of their mouths, that he does have sort of that itchy sore gum that teething causes. And baby elephants are very good at chewing and relieving that discomfort and actually looking for plants that have the painkiller properties. Hey, little one, you are too cute. I can't believe how much he's grown, though. It really feels as though he's got so much bigger. It's definitely him, though, because we memorized his mother's ears, and she ha she's definitely his mother. The last time I saw Benjamin was on my way home one evening, so it was after our sunset safari, and he climbed, he tried to climb over a fallen tree and managed to get himself stuck. So he, he went first, his front two feet went over it, but his back two feet, he couldn't quite get the momentum he needed, so he remained stranded, straddling this fallen over tree. It was just such a special elephant sighting. And this is his mom, who has provided us with quite the surprise the first time I ever met Benjamin, when she pushed over a an, an slightly older elephant calf. Gracie, I love the name that you have given to your elephant. Gracie was given a stuffed elephant yesterday and she called it, because it looks like the mommy elephant that we're looking at right now, she's called it Olympia because she loves watching gymnastics on the Olympics. Gracie, I think that's a perfect name because, of course, we've seen our elephants do some fascinating gymnastics. And I have to tell you a secret, Gracie, of all the things that you can watch on the Olympics, the gymnastics is my favorite. It's my absolute favorite thing to watch. So I'm glad to know that when I'm watching Olympics, I will think of you and hope that you're watching alongside with me. I always find it fascinating. So Olympia is the name of Gracie's new elephant, and I think it's a perfect name. I couldn't think of a better one myself. And perhaps, perhaps Gracie, I think we should call Benjamin's mom Olympia. In fact, that's what we shall do. Benjamin's mom, everybody, is now called Olympia. And she's called Olympia after Gracie's stuffed elephant that she got yesterday. So a lovely name. Thank you, Gracie. I think it's perfect. And whenever we see Benjamin now, we will know that his mom is Olympia. Perfect. While Olympia feeds away on the branches of her tree, and Benjamin follows suit, they remain relatively difficult to see. And I do want to draw your attention away from him briefly. We will come back to him. But away from him briefly, just to get a view once again of our young female that's currently occupied. And there's something clearly seriously delicious in front of us. Now I'm just going to duck my head down so that she's not bothered by us. <laughs> we did have a new viewer, which was a lovely question, ask why we always duck whenever we see animals. Uh, which we did really enjoy. It was a very special question and we, do, we don't duck because we're scared of them and we're abandoning our cameraman. We duck because there's a camera that we have to, you know, we're not taking refuge. It was a very good point and something that we never explain. And of course we, look, we try and look at things through your eyes, through the viewer's eyes as well and describe to you what's happening around us. And to do that, we have to look through the camera's eyes and watch through the monitor. Look how beautiful she looks in this afternoon sunlight with the dust billowing around her base of her feet. A forehead not quite so wrinkly as Benjamin's. Definitely smoothed out. Perhaps she's had some Botox or collagen. I'm joking, of course and putting that incredible trunk to work. Something here has been of serious interest to her. She's been digging here intently during the entire sighting that we've been enjoying with these elephants. She's just such a magnificent gold color. Oh, itchy, yeah. Did you get some dirt in there? 
And that trunk is useful for anything, from digging to snapping branches. Sniffing for where the best place would be to start digging. And then shuffling through these thorny patches, using her toes and her trunk in conjunction to pull out whatever she can find. And our elephants have to remain thoroughly focused on making sure that they get as much feeding as they can done during the day. There you go, she's pulling out the root system. And of course the roots as well will also have some important sources of pro not just carbohydrates but protein as well, especially those of the acacia trees, which are nitrogen fixers. In other words, they have bacteria in their root systems that help convert the nitrates, nitrites in the soil to nitrates that they can then use. Elephants know this. It's, an, it's a source of water, food, and especially protein at the same time. I mentioned that we try and look at things through our viewers' eyes, but at the same time try and give a description to what is happening around us and what it is we're experiencing. And loser, 19, 19, 1988, I'm not being insulting, I promise to all of our other viewers, that is the username that we have. Um, so loser, 1988, I apologize that you feel that way. Um, you've asked a lovely question just by the way, which is what do elephants smell like? And the answer is they smell musty, like they smell like a mixture between, oh my word, so they smell grassy but at the same time they smell almost like, you know that scent of a second-hand bookshop with old books, that smell that most people absolutely love? To me elephants smell like a combination of grass and plant matter and old bookshop two of my favorite smells in the world combined into my absolute favorite smell in the world which is that of an elephant closely followed by that of a black rhino their smell is amazing and spending time with them is equally amazing watching them flap their ears now she's been standing in this golden sunlight and of course it is midwinter here or late winter now but in summer, our temperatures go right up to over 40 degrees, so well into the 110, 115 Fahrenheit. Abu Sheikh, no, elephants don't sweat. They do not sweat. And what that means is that they have to approach cooling down in a very different manner. And that is where their enormous ears come in so incredibly handy. So the skin is very thin and filled with blood vessels that's much much thinner than anywhere else on their bodies filled with blood vessels that provide an enormous surface area then what the elephant does is it flaps its ears and provides air movement which in turn cools down the blood flowing through its ears which is then pumped through to the rest of its body to help cool it down marvelously effective and essentially an elephant's ears are its air conditioning unit beautifully designed creatures however strange they may look to some people. While I try and reposition to find us a good view of Benji, that was one angry elephant. Could you hear that <laughs> pretty clearly? I'm sorry, I was in the middle of sending you over to Hayden. What is going on? prehistoric sounds of elephants I think shouting at each other not at lions that's what it sounded like it sounded like upset elephants upset with each other okay, I'm going to try and finish my train of thought now that all of it is quietened down and it sounds a little bit less like Jurassic Park here in the African bush <laughs> while we try and reposition to find Benji let's jump back on the back with Hayden and find out what he's up to So folks, we, uh, we've just made our way from one side of the reserve to the other and we're coming down now to just go and have a look at what Karula's up to. We just called in one of the other vehicles to see if it was okay for if we joined them and Mike said please come along. So let's go and see what they're up to. 
just going nice and quiet. Of course, just around the corner, we're not far away at all. And I'm hoping that she's going to be a little bit more uh, active, or the cubs particularly, so you can see them. Just in this area just up ahead of us here. So we're heading just to those, well, I was going to say just to those trees over there. I can tell which trees they are because I'm recognizing the, the location, but there's lots of trees. So that's just, just in here. I'm just going to relocate, reposition, because it's going to make too much noise and I don't want to scare this little guy out of the tree. I think one of the youngsters is up the tree. So let's see if I can sort this out, Viam. We're just going to cross back to Jamie so you don't have to watch all this repositioning. Better for me as well so I can look like I'm really smooth and just have gotten in there. Um, let's cross over to Jamie. She's got some more rallies. I'll see you now. My shuffling around, while Hayden does his shuffling around, my shuffling around didn't go quite so according to plan because Benjamin and his mom Olympia are currently very much hidden behind a very large quarry bush. And so we've decided to stay with this beautiful female as she munches away in the golden African light. And perhaps we'll even be treated to a spectacular sunset over the next few moments. A very, very good question, and welcome to uh, Carol and Sue. It's lovely to have you on board. I'm enjoying, I enjoyed your question because it's something I had absolutely not thought about, but it raises a good point. Carol and Sue says, are elephants more wrinkled during a drought period? And yes, uh, to me, it makes sense that they would be, because of course they lose subcutaneous fat, they lose body mass, and as a result their skin looks slightly more baggy around their bodies and that in turn would probably mean that they look slightly more wrinkled. I've never thought of it before. You do raise a good point. If they are, I don't think it's hugely noticeable, but they would be, surely. Makes sense. Basically almost like they're wearing clothes that have been stretch stretched in the laundry, which is what elephants look like at the best of times kind of baggy outfits that they wear over them. That's even more pronounced, I guess, in our time of drought. A oh, beautiful girl. I know you're wrinkly, but I think you're lovely. I think she was insulted. I think she's decided she's had enough of us talking about her wrinkles. She's also had enough of whatever it was she was enjoying so enthusiastically. Sure. <laughs> Another wonderful question, speaking about the drought, and we are going to need to reposition because now our elephant has disappeared almost completely. Wolf Tiger wants to know how much water an elephant will need in one week. It's a good question. So d give me a second. Now on average, an elephant will eat probably close, or drink, sorry, drink probably close to about 50 liters per day times by seven gives you a rough estimate of, oh my goodness, what is, what, how many days in a week? Seven, and I've said 50 liters. So, 
so 35 I'm sorry 350 350 liters I don't know I'm I used to be good at maths I promise I used to be good at mathematics um, so about roughly 350 odd liters a day uh, a week more or less depending upon the elephant size so that was quite a high estimate for a large elephant but it could be even more depending on if it's a male or a female and even youngsters will need especially in the first few months of their lives will need less in the way of water because they're obviously drinking the milk from their mothers now while we reposition let's go and find out how Hayden's repositioning has gone and whether or not he has a lovely view of the Queen of Juma Well, our reposition went pretty well, uh, and it was a very fine time to come up because we've got Karula in a much better spot for us to be able to see her. She's keeping close guard over this Tambuti tree in front of us, and if we go up that tree, and Vian is going to zoom in on the last part of that carcass, and there is one very, very beautiful creature chowing down on the, la the remains, the last bits of meat on this, uh, this impala. And that is one of Karula's carbs. I just can't quite make out through there whether it's Hasana or Shongile, but uh, I will be able to do that in a minute. There's another vehicle here, which is um, great, great guys from Cheetah Plains, and they've uh, brought us in on this. They're about told us they're about to move off shortly, so once they move off, we'll reposition again, and uh, we will get another shot of another angle, and we'll be able to tell if that's um, Shongile, Shongile or, or uh, Hosanna. So how beautiful the, <laughs> the, the carcass is hanging on by not much at all. It's not going to be very long before it hits the ground. And I'm just expecting to see that naughty little face again of the child that breaks the cookie jar. Um, but it's a great thing to see that little cub up that tree. And there's no sign of the, uh, of the hyena. So that was a really interesting thing this morning. That hyena just moved off. But it might have been, it definitely had an injured leg this morning. Uh, we just don't know. That's one of the things about the bush. As well, you just don't know. You can follow the story as much as you possibly try to, but other times it just ends off going off into the distance. Beautiful, really honing his skills, as I said yesterday, learning how to feed on the most uh, precious parts of that carcass and the. His mum will teach him that as well, or her mum, and her mum is right there, right behind, okay, so the other cub is down there with, Liam's got a fantastic vantage point. It has happened, the guys told me the other night, um, happens quite a lot. It's really interesting. These guys, they head up the tree singularly instead of going up as a as a uh, brother and sister. They go up one at a time and feed. And it's this little guy's turn at the moment. Paul just sent us a comment as well. Paul, fantastic comment. They did hit the, they won the leopard lottery. Uh, they getting gorilla as a mum, that's for sure. They've um, definitely uh, had a very, very big stroke of luck in their life as little cubs because she is um, an exceptional mother. And uh, they are hopefully going to make it through to a ripe age themselves. But thank you very much, Paul, for that comment. I totally agree with you there. really getting into it there. So on the leopard's little skull, he's got, 
you know, can, uh, the characteristics of a carnivore are those very, very pronounced canines, which we've all seen on a on a carnivore when they open their mouth and yawn. You've got those wonderful big uh, canine teeth, which are used to hold and pierce, and um, really are the killing teeth. Those teeth. And then in between those canines you've got incisors and those incisors are used for stripping off the fur or feathers off an animal um, and they're really tools to get down to the, the, the tissue for the animal to eat. And then right at the back you've got um, the, the carnassial teeth or the shearing teeth and they're the ones that, oh you have got a keen eye, Mr. Veeam, Bill the Beast, he's just spotted the other youngster over there hiding, well not hiding, but sitting behind that vegetation. So those carnassial teeth are what they'll shear that meat off like scissors and uh, and then take as much as they possibly can. So he's really making good work of that. Well, a lot of people watching a uh, um, sending in messages and telling me that this looks like Shongile. Thank you so much everyone because that's um, the sort of assistance I know I need. I'm not as familiar with these cubs as you are uh, and a lot of people think that this is the female Shongile. So really thank you a lot for your help. It's always great to have you watching and helping me with things like that. So that means that we've got Hosanna, the uh, younger sorry, the male cub down on the ground. It looks, looking through there, I can see that he does look considerably larger. Uh, you can see there, very hard to see, isn't it? Sorry, through that, very difficult. There's just spots we can see there. But I've got a little bit of a different angle than you. Look, this, um, come back to this uh, carcass VM. It looks like it's about to <laughs> drop out of the tree. It's only hanging on by, oops, yes, well that'll be the head and vertebrae which Sean uh, Gilly has just cleaned for us to get a good visual um, and you can just see how much they get off that, he's cleared as much meat as he possibly can off that, that uh, neck. Very tender part for him and here he comes down the down the tree. She comes so I do apologize. Beautiful light there. She's just having a little little sit. Now this is always a testing time as well. Shongile is going to come down and descend and this is a learning curve always for these cats, it's an instinctive thing. Of course they have the ability to do it, but they have to learn techniques. Every tree is different. And uh, look at this, beautiful rest, go turn around backwards, rest the little rump into the fork there. And go, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> and down the rest of the way she goes. Isn't that brilliant? And over to mum. Yeah, that's what we like to see. So there is one female leopard cub with a full belly. <laughs> Beautiful. Really beautiful. There's mum. So I think Mike's going to move off now, so I might just move up into that position there. And uh, we'll have a look at Karula and Hasana. got a question from Isla asking whether she, do you think uh, Shongile will take some of her mum's territory? It's very, very difficult to say 
Uh, I th think it's a great question. Welcome on board, by the way. Sorry, I'm just negotiating this, um, this location here. It's a really great question, but uh, oh, we get a lovely little shot of the cub here. Just let me get into position. I want to answer your question properly for you. There's a lovely little bit of... How's that going to be for you, VM? Is that good? Now he's going to go up the tree. Look at this. This is what I just said before. Isn't this interesting? Shongile comes down and Hosanna goes up. Isn't that interesting? So Shongile has had her fill and uh, now this little, little guy is going to go up into the tree as well. Let's see how he does today. Oh, I'm going to have another think about it. Here we go again. Huh? He's thinking about it. How do I do it? How did I do it yesterday? He says, I went to leopard school yesterday, but how do I do it again today? I did it yesterday. I can do it again today. So, sorry, to answer your question again, I do apologise. Um, do I think uh, Shongile may take some of her mum's territory? There's so many external contributing factors. You know, you could get a male come in uh, that pushes another another uh, female or, or another animal around, or you, Karula might get hurt. There might, it's just so many thing, different things that could come about. Um, Karula is getting towards the end of her breeding life around sort of 12 to 15 years of age or 15 years of age roughly all the books say s variations on that and uh, there's always going to be exceptions to the, the rules so she's held this territory for quite some time but she's also let several um, females come through here and it's a really interesting thing so to answer your question with the limited knowledge I have of the future um, anything could happen if these cubs survive which we know uh, we're all hoping they do because of this incredible mother that we're looking at uh, in front of us there's a good chance that she may end up in some, with some of this territory or who knows but I'll tell you what we'll be here to uh, tell the story that's for sure and uh, anything can happen in nature there's always changes, there's always challenges, there's always movements, there's always different animals, different females, different males that come into different territories and uh, we will definitely be here to record that, that for you. <coughs> Yeah, this is a quick, good question, Adam. Um, thank you very much for watching and being with us. Do the cubs eat? Here he goes. <laughs> He's going to have another try, Adam. I'll come to your question, I promise you. I just want to watch little Hasana ascend this tree. You can do it, buddy. Hmm. Now, getting out to that food is the question, he says. I'm just going to just reposition back a foot for VM because he's got a lot of vegetation there. VM, do you think I should just cruise back a bit for you, mate? Just let me just go back about a foot for VM. And I'll come back to your question, I promise you. Oh. How's that, mate? A bit more? Oh, I think this might hit the deck any second, this, uh... Oh, now, now look at that, look at that. That little cub is holding that whole carcass. That little cub is just either repositioning it... Oh, that is incredible strength. Incredible strength. Seven months old, holding the remnants of that car carcass and trying to reposition it so he can get to some... Oh, wow. Wow, let me just roll down a bit. Sorry, mate. There you go. He's still trying. Has he done it? Has he succeeded? 
Come on, buddy. See if you can do this. This is a great look. Pulling it up to try and get to some of the, the soft tissue that's remaining. All the strength he's got. Come on, buddy. Isn't this brilliant? This is a cat. This is leopard school day two for us. The strength. Mum's casting a careful eye down below, watching her boy. That was fantastic. We just got a question from Brooklyn. Oh, sorry, Brooklyn, I'm with you, and I'm just watching Hassana trying to get this up the tree in Brooklyn. I'm coming to your promise. Oh, look at that. Brooklyn, this is brilliant to watch with you, mate. Hassana is seven months old, and he just pulled the remains of that carcass up to a level that he can reach some of the, the last little tidbits of meat there, or tissue, you know, that he's eating really going in there to try and get as much as they can out of it. Brooklyn, um, you're asking whether male leopards dominate a kill like lions do. Well, the interesting thing, Brooklyn, is that... Um, the interesting thing, Brooklyn, is that we have uh, two very, very different cats on our hands here. The, the only true social cat is a lion, and lions, the males, do definitely dominate the, the kill if they're around. But... What we've got here is a solitary cat, predominantly solitary. The only reason why there's three of them here, Brooklyn, is because this is the mother and her two cubs. And uh, when they get to the age where they'll be pushed away from, uh, from her at about 12 to 15 months, uh, they'll be pushed away and have to get on their merry way and start hunting for themselves and become solitary cats as well. Um, they live that pretty much solitary life so the domination over the the kill or the carcass doesn't really occur with leopards like it does with lions and just to I'm not sure if you saw before Brooklyn but um, the female the, the female cub she was just up the top uh, on in the tree feeding before so they're both getting their fair share um, it's just that he looks a little bit bigger because he's a boy but great question Brooklyn so just to, to finally answer that properly for you. The, the lions, um, the males would dominate the kill because they're a, a, a social cat and they live in a pride, whereas uh, these cats, leopards, are solitary. The only reason we've got a few here is because it's a mother and her two cubs. Thanks for watching, buddy. So, so you know, anywhere sort of in that last up to 22 months of their of age, they'll sort of be really independent. But they'll still, they'll still sort of be around in their mother's home range. Um, they'll be looking really fantastic at about 15 months, and when they push off uh, around 18 to 22 months, that's when they'll have to be really doing some serious, serious hunting and all these skills that he's learning right now are going to be put into practice in that time. And then you might see Hosanna and Shongile come through the what they call the natal territory uh, again. But gosh, there's so many, as I said before, contributing factors that could play a part of what happens in these cats' lives. So whilst we're sitting here watching uh, Hassana have a really good meal there, or the last remnants of it. We're going to cross over to Jamie and have a, uh, a look at what she's up to with some fantastic creatures that she's been with all afternoon.
isn't this view just truly spectacular? We're back with Olympia and little Benjamin off on her right on our left. And what a stunning sighting this has turned out to be. It's just been elephants everywhere. They've all been coming out behind us, joining the rest of the herd. And it's such a pleasure to just sit and spend time with them and listen to the sounds of them feeding. Hello to our beard, who's been very observant as to the anatomy of our elephants. And our beard wants to know if elephants have good depth perception, since their eyes are positioned so far apart on either side of their heads. Uh, thinking about it, I'm not 100% sure about their depth perception. I know that they have a very solid blind spot underneath the front of their faces, which isn't really what you're asking. I also know that they have very, very good spatial awareness which I think would go on to suggest that they do actually have good depth perception at the same time. Because if you watch the way an elephant moves, for an enormous animal of that size, they are so graceful, they're not clumsy at all. And they never ever squash their babies or run into each other, get into each other's personal space, knock themselves or knock their feet or trip over obstacles. They are just animals that for their size are very, very graceful, which I have utmost respect for because, I mean, I'm not the size of an elephant, nor do I have the blind spot, and yet I manage to trip over every obstacle that finds, even imaginary obstacles, I will fall over. And somehow these magnificent creatures don't seem to have the same problem, or the same level of clumsiness, which to me suggests, because studies have been done into the center of their brain that is devoted, they've actually got nerve cells in the part of their brain that's hugely developed, that's devoted to their proprioception and their awareness of the world. It's one of the reasons why if you put an elephant in front of a mirror and you draw a dot on its shoulder, it turns around and it touches its shoulder where the dot is, which is something only dolphins and whales do. It's that kind of recognizing an individual, or human beings of course, and some of the greater apes, but it's recognizing... <laughs> I don't start that again. She's very defensive over her food, is what we've just learned. This is now the second time she's done that in our presence. And immediately the young elephant is squealing. And I start to wonder whether or not that squeal, that sign of distress, is exactly what it means. Is there a submissive level to it as well? An apology. Sorry, 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 sorry kind of deal. Because that's, that's Benjamin's mother, that's Olympia. She's done that before. I wonder if she is very defensive over food, which makes sense, and she has every right to be. It is a drought, and she is lactating, which means she's got to support her own body weight and, at the same time, provide for a little one. And I have to go back and compare. I'm just keeping an eye on what's going on. I'd have to go back and compare now to the footage that we experienced earlier, but I wonder if this young male, it's not the same one. Or is it? How fascinating would that be? We did experience an incident a couple of months ago where the Benjamin Button's mom, and Benji's mom, pushed over a young male calf. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that young male looked like. And of course, this one is relatively nondescript, but we would be able to know if we could compare the sizes of the two. Because then perhaps this young male is a previous calf, which would explain why he's often in her personal space. Oh, the plot thickens. I have absolutely no idea. It's just a very interesting aspect of elephant behavior that we've just experienced. And I mean, this elephant is now completely unfazed back to feeding, relaxed around mom. An interesting little demonstration of how elephants get cross with other elephants and get into each other's space. And that's why that trumpeting that we so often hear is unless you get it regularly and uh, there's an almost panicked sound to the sound that elephants make when they see predators, but when you get one soft trumpets like that or screams like that, then you know that it's another elephant causing that upset. We see it on a regular basis on our drives. 
And just by the way, a funny little aside, the sound is the same sound that you would hear on Jurassic Park. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Let's go see if those little cubs have knocked the carcass out of the tree yet. Well, Jamie, this carcass looks like it's about to fall, but Asana is holding on to it. With, you can just see the power in those claws, holding on to it with both feet there. It's hanging on by a probably, oh, it was hanging on. <laughs> it was hanging on. Oh, Mum nearly got hit by uh, the last leg there. Now Mum is also quite concerned that that drop to the ground will attract any predators like hyena particularly in weight and look she's taking it back up look at that look at that quick 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 here comes the hyena oh she's dropped it she's dropped it there he was he's waited patiently he's waited patiently uh oh the other cub is around there he has waited patiently for that to drop and you saw that chain of events happening there folks. We could not have come back at a better time. Hats off to everyone in final control there for the <laughs> intuition you had there and Jamie to just come back at perfect time because it was hanging on by a thread. Little Osana couldn't hold on any longer, took one more bite, it dropped to the ground. Mum jumped up, grabbed it, tried to get it back up the tree for Osana because the sound of that drop was going to trigger that come down and grab that meal mechanism in that hyena. Completely, perfectly done. And listen to that. Listen to that crunching through those bones. Now, we've got another story unfolding. This is brilliant. I do need to reposition for VM just to have one little better look here at what's going on. How's that for you mate? Not, very, not much better is it? You see the hyena down there? Okay. Wow, that was a fantastic little sequence of events there. And luckily, our, uh, our family of leopard are okay. But our hyena who has been waiting patiently, I knew, I thought it was just odd that that hyena had disappeared, but of course, until that hyena heard that noise hit the ground, it's just been waiting up there, waiting, waiting, avoiding the conflict, and now has won the spoils of that the last part of the carcass. And you can hear the incredible crushing through those incredible bones. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. So there are loads of statistics about uh, the bite, the power of the bite of a, of a hyena. But let me tell you, without going into all the pounds per square inch, because that doesn't mean an, an immense amount to a lot of people, um, supposedly only one animal in Africa that's got a stronger bite, and that is the Nile crocodile. So you can imagine the immense power. You can just hear how this, it's like, just crushing those bones like pretzels. Now just try and get a better sp spot for you, VM. One more little step back, I think, mate. And you're going to get a better shot there or not? Yep. A little bit better shot there. It's still got 
some little bits of vegetation in front of it, but you can see how that hyena is just motoring through, stripping any remnants of soft tissue. Bit tricky to get our cats. I wonder if I go around there, VM, you'll get the cats and the hyena. Yeah? Okay. I'm just discussing with VM folks, just um, ideas because I always try and get him into the best possible position to get the shots. So just bear with us. I'm just going to cross back over to Jamie folks while we reposition and get this all, all ready for you and uh, I think she's with those beautiful Ellie's again. How cool was that what we just saw? This is brilliant. Okay, we'll be back with you just now. Oh, well, Hayden's been enjoying an amazing leopard sighting. It sounded absolutely wonderful. We've been sitting peacefully with our elephants, watching Olympia slowly but surely remove what is left of this bush willow, systematically breaking off the branches and then munching along in a conveyor belt manner, picking off the bark and giving us a perfect demonstration of the way that all of the elephants are feeding at the moment. This essentially is the nutrients that they will have to rely on for the rest of the season until we get to probably round about October, hopefully October. Actually, no, that's not true. September, look at the, look at the coordination that this takes. That's a huge branch. It might not be very, it will be heavy enough. She's doing that purely with her trunk and with her mouth, but there's all kinds of other matter, the branches in the way. And she's managed to maneuver it perfectly, which brings us back to the, the depth perception, or at least the, the perception of the world around them and the way in which they manage it. They're incredibly coordinated beings, although I'm slightly terrified. If she gets any closer with that, it might whip us in the head if it springs back <laughs> away from those trees. But sorry, that's not true. September is when the knob thorns are going to start to flower, or to at least to get their leaves, and that is when the elephants will start switching to them. And Super John is awesome, lovely to have you on board. Super John is awesome, I'd like to know what the biggest natural threat is to an elephant. Very good question. Um, in, in terms of probably what kills most elephants throughout Africa, not including human beings, because you did ask for natural. <laughs> She's like a dog with a too big stick, and she can't quite work out exactly how to maneuver it around. Sorry, Super John. Uh, the answer to that is probably lack of resources, whether it's water or food, mostly food, because of course they do need to eat all day, every day. That would be their biggest natural threat, particularly in a situation like this where there is a drought. And if this drought were to continue for another year, which of course we're hoping that it doesn't, we're going to see enormous deaths of animals like elephants, bulk grazers, bulk grazers as well, buffaloes, zebra, a lot of the animals out here that are rely, reliant on plant matter to survive. And it'll be food that gets them here before, it, before the thirst does, or hunger, rather. After that, in terms of natural predators, which I imagine was also part of your question, the only animal that is capable of taking down an elephant is a lion, and even then, they very seldom risk it. Because even a little baby like Benjamin over here, as vulnerable as he looks, a lion would think very hard before trying to tackle a baby because mom and the rest of the herd would immediately step in to defend it. And speaking of mothers and offspring and the bond between them, let's go back across to our lovely leopard family. So folks, that's why we reposition, because look at that frame of that magnificent, magnificent leopard, Karula, finishing off. She actually ended up getting the last remnants. She got a part of the, the impala as she ran back up the, uh, the tree. 
and she's just dropped a couple of little bits and the, the hyena is directly under this tree. But how beautiful does that look through that foliage? Oh, the embodiment of feline beauty and strength in this cat, my favourite, favourite cat. She's just perfect, isn't she? But you can hear the crunching downstairs. There's two crunching sounds you can hear here. One is Karula going through her last bit and down on the ground is a hyena that is crunching its way through every leg bone left on that impala carcass and has just pretty much consumed the lot. Pretty much consumed the lot and is sniffing around looking for any last bit. So folks, I'm actually uh, going to have to move off very shortly um, to give these little cubs some peace and protection and her as well as night falls. Uh, she needs to have a bit of vision and I really don't want to be here longer than we should and I really think that we've been privileged, hugely privileged to see what we just saw. Uh, Karula finishing that meal, Hassan is still up the tree, and Shongile will be somewhere up on, the, up on that bank watching the goings on as that hyena just motored on down as soon as it heard that carcass hit the ground. So I'm gonna say farewell to this beautiful creature and I think you'll understand why. Putting my camera away. And we'll just have a few more seconds of that beautiful shot. Thank you, my friends. That was extraordinary. We're going to cross over to the wonderful Jamie Patterson, but I just want to show you something that I found that I should have shown you the other day, and some people will know what this is. That has been with us the last few days, and that is the lucky porcupine quill. Well, it's certainly made me a happy boy and hopefully has made you happy at home. We've seen some extraordinary, uh, just interesting, super interesting leopard behavior in the last 36 hours and uh, very, very privileged. So whilst I'm heading up to try and find a little spot where I can see some bats, Let's cross over to Jamie and see what she's up to. We'll see you just now. Oh, I definitely feel like a very happy and very privileged woman on this beautiful afternoon to spend the time that we have with the lovely elephant herd. Now, I'll move back slightly to try and get you a view of Benjamin. 
but it didn't go according to plan, so let's try one more shuffle forward. Unfortunately, it is getting a little bit too dark for us to be able to view our ellies properly. And just like Hayden, at some point we will have to leave our sighting. I know I did say that we would try and get back to the lines. They have been busy with people, or at least there have been other vehicles coming in. Hey, big girl, do you mind if we stay here? Thank you, girl. And there is Benjamin. So I did promise we'd try and go back to the lines. Unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity this afternoon. And now it is a little bit too dark. Oh, there you go, practicing that coordination that will one day stand him in good stead. <laughs> With his wrinkled forehead. Isn't he lovely? Never seen a baby elephant. It's got the little tufts of hair have sort of disappeared. So it doesn't quite look like he's had implants. Hello, little one. Don't come and cause nonsense. Your mummy's very protective. I would prefer it if you didn't. As a male calf, Benjamin will have a slightly, or he'll have more curiosity. He'll be more inclined to being slightly brave when it comes to other things in his world, which includes vehicles. Because we're a much a part of their world as the trees and the termite mounds. And something fun for baby elephants to interact with. And you usually see that behavior, for, although you'll see it from both males and females, you'll see it more commonly in the male calves. Oh, itchy. A bit of a scratch. He's <laughs> got the leaves all over his back. <laughs> well, perhaps I could go back and reposition. We'll see how we go. Let's try. Whoop. Sorry, everybody. I hope you aren't motion sick. There we go. Mom, you're going to drop sticks on Benji's head. Yep, okay. Well, he doesn't seem too concerned. Something's got the elephants a little bit agitated. Benjamin and his mom are still fine. They're perfectly relaxed. But I've seen a couple of them move past with stiff tails and head up in the air. Now that female that just went past us, she is, she came running across relatively uncomfortable. I know it is getting very, very dark, so we've just got her silhouette for now, which is beautiful in its own way. And I wonder if it's not the lions on the move. Unfortunately, as I said, we can't put spotlights on the cubs, nor do we put spotlights on elephants, but they're huge and grey, and they provide us with a nice viewing opportunity for the last few moments of light that we have, and though it is getting a bit dark, I'm just so reluctant to leave the sighting. It's beautiful. <laughs> Trying to come and see what mom, what's had mom's attention all this time. She hasn't left you much, little one. Okay, I think it is time for us to say goodbye to our elephant pair and actually our elephant herd. Hopefully we'll be able to catch up with Benjamin on the sunrise safari tomorrow. In the meantime, my plan for the rest of the evening is to go and not look for those lions directly. But I think that they're going to go and stash those cubs somewhere and then go hunting. So what we'll do is we'll loop the area rather than looking for the, where we left them. We'll do a loop of the area, see if perhaps we don't catch one or two of the lionesses moving out as they start to go out into their hunting expedition for the evening. So that is the plan for the rest of the night. It's too dark, I think, for our Ellies. It's time to go see what else we can find as night and the cool weather descends. Let's make sure I'm not about to roll back into another elephant. I'm rolling back just to avoid starting the engine and probably wouldn't bother them. But at the same time, why bother them unless we have to? Well, we have to now. We hit a bump. Oh, come on, rust bucket. Thank you. Micah, hello and welcome. I hope you've been enjoying our sunset safari and our elephant sighting in particular. He wanted to know a little bit about elephant aging and how old the elephants are that we've been viewing. So elephant aging is not an exact science. Initially, 
the first stages of their lives are relatively okay, it's relatively easy. Basically, before the age of about late two-year-old to three-year-old is when they start getting their visible tusks. So that's when you can start to age them that way. You learn by experience how fast a baby elephant grows. I would put Benjamin at, he's now eating solid food. So there you go, there's a marker. Baby elephants usually start to feed on solid food at around six months of age. So that's the start. So he's over six months, but not by much, just judging by his size. So that's the little elephant with the wrinkly forehead we were looking at. His mom, on the other hand, is still a young fe female. I know that just judging by her size, her behavior, and also by the level of indentations around her temporal region. So elephants, as they get older, like human beings and all other mammals, they lose subcutaneous fat and elasticity, which means that their skin starts to sink in. And the bones of older elephants, especially around the, the skull, become more prominent. But it's not an exact science and it's not easy and you can't gauge off the amount of tusk, for example, that an elephant has. If an elephant has long tusks, it doesn't, yes, very big tusks probably means that the elephant's quite old because elephant tusks grow throughout their lives. But if an elephant has short tusks, doesn't mean that it's young because that is the way that they, that it's like genetics, it's like some human beings have grow taller or shorter, that's how elephants work, some don't have tusks at all. So not an exact science unless you're really into studying the biology of human aging, but still a very, very interesting thing to look into. Let's go back to Hayden who has managed to accomplish his goal and is busy with some flapping nocturnal creatures. So I just got up to this little spot here and we just spotted some little micro bats. Now I'm not exactly sure of the species here, I'm not familiar with them, but what they are doing at the moment, we touched on it last night, we've got a few more minutes tonight and I don't want to harp on it too long, but it's very interesting. So these little bats are hunting at the moment, they're hunting insects, they're insectivorous bats, it's really hard VM's trying to, to, run to find these little bats. We're flying around this tree and they're using echolocation, a series of very, very high frequency signals that they send out to uh, find out where that prey is and it bounces back to their ears and they dodge through the air and grab it. Now we can't hear it with our ear which is only up, sort of has an audible range up to about 20 kilohertz. Kilohertz is the, the measurement, uh, but I'm going to give you a little demonstration now of this machine here called a bat detector right here. And if we turn it on, I've got it on a frequency that I'm having a guess that they might uh, operate on. And it sounds a bit fuzzy at first, but wait till you hear. This machine takes in their frequency and turns it into a frequency that's audible to our ear. It's fantastic. Did you hear when he, when he hunts something? Isn't that the coolest? That is so cool. I just love that. So it's got a little bit of interference, but listen. That is the coolest thing. So what's happening? It's really, really cool. It's a great little bit of kit. If you want to get one of the kit, you want to get one of these for your kids or your family, you can look online. They're called bat detectors. They range from really, really fancy ones to uh, to these sort of ones. In the, this is a middle of the range one. It's bomb proof for kids as well. And uh, it just shows you that the living landscape that we're in is not just the big mammals. These animals here are incredibly important, these little mammals, and they represent probably are arguably the largest group of mammals on the planet. So bats, there's more species of bats than any other single group of uh, mammals on the planet. And these little insectivorous ones, I know there's horseshoe bats here, uh, and I'm really not sure of the other ones. I think I think the other ones are free-tailed bats, I think. The other ones are here. I've got to ask uh, 
Steph and a couple of the other guys. But, you know, we don't talk about them a lot because we don't have any way of seeing them other than flitting through the sky. But when you've got a little bit of kit like this, you can start to investigate a little bit more. But I just think that's great. It's a great sound, isn't it? And that's echolocation. Um, what we want to try and see is we had it on last night and we were pointing it around near an elephant herd. It wouldn't affect the elephants, I promise you. This sound doesn't affect the animals at all. Um, but we were getting this really weird signal on this from uh, when it was going near the elephant herd. Just one more sh little little listen before you go. It's so cool. Wow. From bats and bat detectors to the king of the woodland, forest, jungle, whatever you want to call it. Jamie has got something special to finish with you. I'll see you just now. I do indeed have something special for you, and we just totally bumped into them by mistake as we were driving along. We came across the most beautiful scene of the Nkuhumas on a termite mound with their little cubs. Now, all I wanted to do was just show you ever so briefly before we leave. So it's just a surprise sighting. Obviously, I've got no lights on them. They are just illuminated by the setting sun. And I hope that they are successful on their hunting endeavours this evening. They're probably going to look for somewhere to keep their little ones. One of the little ones is even brave enough to come and investigate as we sort of stumbled upon them. Oh, look at it. You're sleepy. Somebody's a little reluctant to get up. Eh? I'm tired. And then if you look down here, look at this little one. A little bit further down and to the right. Go down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, little cub. Hidden, watching us. All right, so we're going to leave our Nkuhumas to their nocturnal endeavors. We can't stay with them because they've got little cubs with them. And we'll wish them the best of luck. As a team of women, or at least female animals set off on their adventures. And then there is one, by the way, in front of us as well, in the middle of the road. Oh, sorry. Duck, Jamie, duck. <laughs> one lioness in the road. Okay, let's go. Let us leave them be. Beautiful, beautiful scene with all of the lions on a termite mound, really stunning. Bye-bye, guys. Okay, we'll go this way then. We won't go the way I intended to go at all. I don't suppose one can complain about a lion roadblock, though, can you? Some people are stuck in traffic. I have to detour because there's lions in the road. It really doesn't quite compare. And as this evening starts to draw to a close, let's go and have a look at the view that Hayden's got. Well, what a beautiful uh, spot to sit and say farewell to you tonight. Uh, I am just absolutely amazed with this place on constantly. What we saw today was another chapter of amazing uh, uh, behavior from leopard and uh, hyena and that sort of eternal enemy sort of uh, script that plays out. And we had some really lovely encounters with giraffe. We had a really beautiful drive this morning. Just love this place. So just got a quick question from Gemmelin, uh, who wants to know where the bats go in the daytime, because uh, most bats are nocturnal, nearly all bats in the world, not all, but most of them are nocturnal. And uh, they find a little crevice or a little hole in a tree. That's why it's really, really important to have the habitat for these animals. If there's no trees around or places for the bats to roost, uh, they won't have the habitat and they'll move to other areas. So those little old dead trees, never think standing dead wood is, is a bad thing because there's lots of creatures that will uh, live in that standing dead wood and that's where they'll roost during the day. Some are uh, 
uh, they will, they will be more of a there's some solitary bats sorry and there's also some uh, bats that will be in little colonies in there and it, all different species depend on all different numbers and I've really got to do my study up on on the bats that occur around here but I never thought of it uh, until I thought of bringing the bat detector which I've used in the UK and I use in Australia and it's a great thing for kids as well really great thing Valerie's asking what the sound that comes out of this is. Well, this little thing is called a bat detector, and the bat's frequency is a much, much higher frequency. You can see those numbers around there. They're all the different frequencies. Our ears operate underneath 20. Most bats operate between sort of 30 to 120 or 110, and there's all different species. So the bats, I think, around here are operating at about 40 to 50 kilohertz. So I just had a guess then and put it on, and what it does is it takes in the frequency from the bat into those little holes there, okay, takes it into the machine, mixes it with another sort of what's called a harmonic frequency. I'm trying to get all this right because I'm looking, VM's looking over my shoulder here, and he's the guru on things like this. But then what pops out of that little speaker is an audible sound of that bat's echolocation, the little clicks and everything that's going at such a high frequency that it hunts with on the wing. It's very, very cool. So I think this is about time that I sat with this sunset for a little bit and I said farewell to you for today and it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you. I'm going to make this snappy. Just thank you for watching. Newcomers, I hope we've got you hooked. Regulars, it's great to be back and see you for such a, just a short time. We're going to cross over to the wonderful Jamie Patterson and see what she's going to show us to finish with. It's been a great day in the magnificent Juma uh, and private game reserve here in Sabi Sand, South Africa. Love this place. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye now. It has indeed been a, another beautiful evening here on Juma. I didn't even get further afield, which was originally my intention. I was going to go and explore perhaps Arethusa, maybe Cheetah Plains. I hadn't quite made up my mind. But as it was, the lions and the elephants made up our mind for us. And we're definitely not complaining. And so, for the last few moments of our sunset safari, as I hit the lights, so as not to shine them on the poor impala that are all over quarantine, we're going to go and investigate the game path that runs along the southwestern corner of quarantine, where we started our bushwalk for on Monday morning, on Monday morning sunrise safari, and found fresh, fresh diggings of an art fark. And it seems like it's quite a popular pathway. Like human beings, animals make their own paths and they use them. It's easier, it's quieter, you don't have to worry about thorns, well, you have to worry less about thorns poking you in the face or the eye. And so I thought maybe, just maybe, there might be a chance of encountering one of our lesser seen nocturnal beasties. You never know what might turn up. Or as Hayden would say, you never know what's around the next corner. And certainly the place never fails to surprise us with a bundle of fantastic sightings. And my first afternoon working with Zunder, of course, and this has been tremendously good fun, watching him see the animals. And there's always a, a joy, and having new viewers as well, and our regular viewers. But our joy as guides comes from sharing it with other people, sharing those moments with other people. And ourselves, yes, we get a certain peace and a love of nature, but it is definitely compounded by sharing it and experiencing and creating memories with other people as well. And I look back now at some of because social media is doing this thing of throwing back photographs from a year or two years or three years back and something will pop up and I'll immediately remember the sighting and the guests that I was with and the characters that I was with, the personalities and the amazing fun that we had in, at those times. And that of course is what your screenshots have started doing as well, the screenshots from a year ago when I started working here. One lovely one of Sindile popped up back when he was still young and with shadow. All kinds of amazing memories to look back upon in the future.
Super John is awesome. It's lovely to have you on board once again. Would the safari be more dangerous during the night or during the day for the prey? Nighttime is more dangerous for the prey species. Um, we tr for us, we don't interfere more in the day or in the night. We try not to interfere at all when it comes to the hunts, but we do not spotlight the prey species at night in order not to affect their night vision, their ability to see in the dark. So that it doesn't make a difference for the prey species in terms of our movements, but it does in terms of the predators' movements because, of course, the night time is when the big cats come out to play and the spotted hyena too. But we'll have to wait until tomorrow morning to unravel the mysteries of what has occurred during the evening. I know the Inkahumas are hungry, though it remains to be seen what happens. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so a big thank you to Zander for his fantastic camera work and for going out with me and pitting up with me for the very first time, as well as to Rebecca and to Kirsty in final control. And most importantly, as Hayden said, to our new viewers and our regular viewers, always lovely having you on the back of the vehicle, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. See you on the Sunrise Safari.